It's Lieben's. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. Always talking about we work together. Good morning. Um, Whoa. Uh, chairs. Yes, it's been a while since I banged the gavel. Um, our chair, Steve Johnson, uh, was a little under the weather today, so he asked me if I would run the meeting. So I'll give it my best shot. I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting on October 22nd, 2019 to order. We will start the meeting with an invocation by the Reverend Clark Edwards from the First United Methodist Church of Bradenton, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, we come to you this day with thanksgiving for all of your blessings in life. We give you thanks for this another day to do your will in this great community of Manatee County. We are excited about the possibilities before us to follow the words of the prophet Micah, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before you, O oh God. We ask your blessing and wisdom upon these elected representatives of our community and the decisions they make for this community. We are grateful for their service to this community. Gracious God, we pray for the needs of this community. We lift, lift up to you our families that they be kept safe in their homes and our children in our schools. We pray for all of our law enforcement officers and fire department and first responders in times of crisis, that they be kept safe in the work they do. We are most grateful, O oh God, of all the blessings you bestow upon us each day, and we give you thanks. And now in the words of St. Francis, we offer these words. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, fear. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have a few items for time certain. Our first item of time certain is 10 o'clock, item 58. Um, at 11 o'clock, we'll have item 55, which is the Port Authority meeting. And then 11.30, we'll take any items that have been pulled from the consent agenda. Are there changes to the agenda, Madam Administrator? Madam Chairman, there are some changes to the, um, the agenda for today. First, starting with ch changes to the consent agenda for property management. That would be item 31. <coughs> That's execution of the contract for sale and purchase from Manatee Ventures, Inc. for property located in Palmetto, Florida at 34221. The legal description and sketch of the property were updated and replaced in exhibits A, B, and C to the contract. And in changes to reports under Public Works, item 61, Florida Department of Transportation, update on Barrier Island Traffic Study. The PowerPoint presentation was added to the agenda item. And then there's an addition to the consent agenda. That's under Parks and Natural Resources, and it'll be item 62, execution of conservation easement to Southwest Florida Water Management District for the Unger Ungarelli Preserve. And that's a request for acceptance, execution, and recording of the conservation easement grant with Southwest Florida Water Management District. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Okay, well, then we'll go right ahead into our uh, Awards, we have a team award. Mr. Barnett? Good morning, Good morning. board. Uh, Mr. Palmer, Ms. Corrier, I'd like to have everybody that was on this team come down here. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of folks. And this is a, a great example we're gonna share with you today. Mr. Hackney's here with his team. I don't think he'll come down, but I want to recognize <laughs> Mr. Hackney, the fact that um, you know, the folks over at the property appraiser's office and our people work so closely together, and that relationship is extremely strong right now. And I, I expect them to continue to build on this. Senate Bill 248 
was a mandate that came down to Manatee, to all the jurisdictions, about protecting critical information of law enforcement and other positions within local and county governments. It was a challenge. We did some of that already, but they expanded that to the people's children and, and, and other things. And our team saw this and said, wow, we've got to do something. Now, everything starts with a parcel ID. And that's our friends at the property appraisers office established that. Once that's established, we go. I'm not gonna say much more about this except that this is a great example of how a team comes together and works. Everybody took a leadership role. Everybody had a role and a duty. And they all knew that the other team member depended on me making sure I did what I was supposed to do. And they did that. And, you know, they'll, Mark will introduce a lot of the people. If he doesn't, I will. But, you know, I want Mark to come up and talk about it. Right here. Thanks, John. So as John said, uh, a lot of what we do really starts and ends with the parcel ID. And under this new uh, amending of Statute 119, it broadened the data elements that were to be hidden from public view to include the parcel ID. So as soon as BADS and PAO kind of recognized that this was going to be the case, they realized right away that it would have profound implications on their ability to conduct business with this protected community. Um, in the course of research, Alan had ran across, uh, and Alan Stearns of the property appraiser's office, had run a, uh, across a, uh, a legal opinion that kind of cleared the way for the implementation of what was called an agency-to-agency non-disclosure agreement. In the past, the way um, protecting this information had been handled was through individual non-disclosure agreements between the property appraiser's office and individual county staff members that needed that information. And then certain bits of information were still public, like the parcel ID, which allowed the county to conduct business as usual, to issue building permits, things like that. So going forward, it was apparent that we would need something broader since these other elements of data were going to be hidden, like the, the parcel ID and things like that. So this agency-to-agency non-disclosure agreement allowed Allen to avail the county um, all of the parcel related information, but it put the onus on the county to now protect that information. Property appraiser's office flags the records that are to be protected. It's the county's job to now protect those records. So that really cleared the way for the uh, implementation of a technical solution. So that's where members of uh, IT, BADS, and again, PAO kind of came together. Uh, they implemented what we call a new SS or S119 number to replace the parcel ID number. So that's what faces the public. And then internally, the county staff has the ability to decode that number, see who they're working with, and conduct business as usual. So again, I think this was a perfect example that really exemplifies the spirit of the Teamwork Award. Uh, we brought together uh, personnel from three different county departments that had to recognize the problem, analyze it, react quickly, formulate a solution, get that approved by legal, executed by the board. Um, and then implemented. And again, it really speaks to the professionalism of everybody involved. Everybody had to bring their A game. This thing was passed in um, April 26th, and it had to be implemented by July 1st. So it was a very, very tight timeline. And uh, so to kind of recognize the problem, come up with a solution, implement the solution, I thought was very commendable. And again, everybody brought their A game, and, and I'd like to thank the whole team. All right. Good, Good job. Commissioner Whitmore wanted to say yeah. something. Well, oh, they're not done. Go ahead. The okay. Name, present them with their award. Wanderson Bully. Oh, everybody gets an award. Cool. Mindy Carver. <laughs> Tammy Higgins. Congratulations. William Clegg. Yeah. Paul Rebenak. She's working. <laughs> Justin. Iris, who? I'll accept Mr. Clegg's award on his behalf, John. Victor Mandes. <laughs> Congratulations, Victor. And Chris give, Solon, he's speech. actually not here today. Alan Stearns. I'm sure they gave him one. <laughs> if he gets one. I'm sure they gave him one. <laughs> we'll find out. <coughs> Don't make me laugh. We have Jeff Pace. Right. Thank you. Uh, Chris Solon. <coughs> 
<coughs> and this is for Priscilla Tupton, which I'll accept on her behalf. She's not with us this morning. And Caddy, Katie Pearson. Caddy. Lacey Pritchard. Ah. And Sanford Zapata. Thanks for your help. And we um, actually, Victor Mondez and Mindy, got Mindy? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Cool. Okay. Well, thank, you. thank you. everybody. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you you kind of lost me on, on replacing the DPID. I mean, that's for us folks in the planning department. That was always what we always relied on to look at everything. So I'm glad I'm not there anymore, and you guys know what you're doing. So I'm very grateful for that. Commissioner Whitmore. Mark, I met you in the elevator, and I asked you what department you were in, and you told me you were talking to Sherry. She knows you well, I guess. And I said, oh, well, you're, guy, you're the genius. And then I just heard what you presented, and I had no <laughs> clue what it was. <laughs> just assuming it's something that was decoded that could be protected between property appraiser and us, and you're, you're making sure. And the main protected, thing is right? it allows the county to, to yes. continue its normal business processes and serve the community. So, so one second meeting, and I was right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And Mr. Palmer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. John, for the viewing public, could you quickly explain the purpose behind this legislation? Can you comment on that at all? <laughs> well, to put you on the spot. Maybe the main good. purpose is to protect the identity of first responders, uh, whether it be law enforcement or critical county employees, code enforcement, things like that. And their family members, and I think it even includes state prosecutors. And it does. Does it include it's, it's judges, very, very for broad. example? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it just protects their personal identifying information from... From folks bad out people. there that from, might be looking to do harm. From correct? bad things. That's fair correct. statement. Didn't say yeah. That's a fair statement. Yeah, yeah. Thank but you, this is another example of the county administrator empowering the staff. Just do it. And they did. They make the magic happen. It's good I'm to like see my Mr. former employee, Katie Pearson, sure with us today. Some of this stuff, but they <laughs> Hello, do. Katie. And finally, our superb property appraiser, Mr. Hackney, is with us today. Charlie, thank you for the excellent work you do for this community. Thank, Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all for being here and for your good work and keep it up. Thanks. Thank you. I move we adopt the proclamations. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Chair votes aye, motion passes. First up, we have, as you can tell, once again, <laughs> Farm City Week, November 9th through the 21st, 2019. Uh, Mr. On, Garrison guys. and the... And Where's Ralph? He's here with his... There family. he is. And the folks, some. please come forward. Yeah. <coughs> he was in our graduating high school class. Mm. All right, my favorite week. <laughs> Whereas the prosperity and well-being of the citizens of Manatee County are highly dependent upon the cooperation, communication, understanding, and respect between agricultural producers, whether they harvest the land or the sea, and the urban population. And whereas <coughs> this year's Farm City Week celebration will highlight fresh catch and will spotlight the past, present, and future of Manatee County seafood industry and working waterfronts. And whereas Manatee County is home to the historic fishing village of Cortez, one of the last remaining working waterfronts in the state of Florida, and Manatee County's commercial fishermen land an average of six million pounds of wild caught seafood every year. And whereas Manatee County is home to multiple bivalve shellfish aquaculture farms, which produce hard clams, oysters, and Sunray Venus clams, and whereas Manatee County seafood producers continue to provide high-quality products, even in the face of challenges presented by red tide, pollution, development, regulation, and foreign competition, and the county seafood industry continue to provide sustainable seafood through wild fisheries and bivalve aquaculture, supporting valuable economic contributions to our county, state, and nation.
And whereas Farm City Week provides an opportunity for the general public to better understand the contribution and challenges of commercial seafood producers, the efforts to maintain sustainable, local, and profitable products, and the renewed opportunity to support Manatee County seafood and industry through the purchase of local seafood. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County, Florida, that November 9th through the 21st, 2019, shall be known, designated, and set aside as Farm City Week in Manatee County, Florida, adopted with a qu uh, quorum present and voting this 22nd day of October and signed by our chairman, Stephen R. Johnson. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Trace. My name is Crystal Snodgrass. I'm the division manager for the Ag and Extension Service, um, and I really appreciate that proclamation. Um, as I'm representing the Manatee County Farm City Week today as a Farm City Week committee today as a member, and um, I just want to thank all of you for recognizing us. Of course, you can tell when we're going to be here today with all the vegetables, um, and today we have starfish on the table. Um, we have not recognized our seafood industry in several several years, um, and it's it's very important. It's a big part of agriculture, and often people People forget that um, in our county um, it's it's a huge part of our history here in Manatee County and we want to remind people we want to remind our citizens of that and I want to thank all of you for doing that and then also our Farm City Week committee for everything that they do uh, many of our <coughs> extension staff sit on that committee as members but then also our staff that do not sit on that committee they set aside a lot of their time to put forth effort um, in addition to their regular duties um, to make those events a really, really great event. So I want to say a big thank you to them as well. Um, so thank you to all of you, and we look forward to the events to come in November. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Great. Turn it over to Patty. 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 Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm wearing my different hat. Well, not really. Ralph's, Ralph wears the hat. I just come. Um, I just wanted to go over a little quick uh, scenario of our schedule of events for this year. We have November 9th. We'll be down at the Bradenton Farmer's Market. We'll have some of our 4-H and FFA kids down there. They'll be doing um, a couple activities with the public, and we'll also have um, some farm equipment down there from Everglades. Oh. On the 11th, we'll be in the Veterans Day Parade. Um, that'll start at Sutton Park around 11 o'clock. I know they always do it around the 11-11 time. And then the parade will start at 11.45, and it'll go from the fairgrounds down to Sutton Park. On the 12th, we'll have our soil speech contest for 6th to 12th graders sponsored by the Manatee River Soil Water Conservation District. And then on the 14th, we'll have our Ag Ventures at the fairgrounds, where we'll have over 1,000 third graders that will come out and um, learn about what, what, um, what agriculture is really about, that butter is not made at Publix and milk's not made at Publix, and they get to learn <laughs> a lot that day. On the 15th, we'll have our Farm City Week tour. Um, this year, we're going to the Wetlands Resource Center, Citrus Grove. Manatee Floral, AP Bell Fish Company, and Strickland Ranch. So um, the buses are filling up, so if you're interested in that, please contact um, the Extension Office, and they can get you coordinated with that. On the 16th, we'll have our beef workshop and prospect show at the fairgrounds, and they'll get to do hands-on workshops and uh, have their animals judged. And then the 19th, we'll have our Kiwanis luncheon that a lot of y'all normally attend. So that'll be on the 19th. We'll reveal our 2019 Agriculture of the Year recipient for the, this year. On the 20th, we'll have our Leadership Manatee Tour. On that one, I didn't bring the list. I know they're going to Dakin Dairy and a couple other um, areas. And then on the 21st, we'll have our Hall of Fame luncheon, uh, wrapping up our week at the Women's Club in Palmetto. Please RSVP to that if you'd like to go to that. And this year, we will be uh, inducting into the Ag Hall of Fame Captain Scott Moore. So, anybody else have anything else to add? <laughs> I, I'm sure Ralph does. Come on, Ralph. Like <laughs> we, we know what we have to hear from Ralph. That's, right. that's right. That's <clears> right. <throat> Good morning, Commissioner. It's great to be here. It's Good one of the morning. earliest uh, times I remember coming here for a Farm City Week uh -huh. proclamation. Uh, Farm City Week's always held the week before Thanksgiving. So, as we get into kind of that season, 
we're starting off early, and you can see the abundance amount of food that we have here. This is about the prettiest display I think I've seen yeah. uh, with it. Unfortunately, I understand you commissioners are taking off uh, after this meeting and have a, another uh, place to be and everything like that, but this is what's local here in Manatee County, and we're awful proud of it. As uh, Patty mentioned, Captain Scott Moore is inducted into the Hall of Fame, Agricultural Hall of Fame. He's a fisherman in Manatee County. He's done so much over the years for the conservation, environmental preservation of our uh, inland waters and everything like that, that we felt it would be a great time to recognize him for all the work that he's done over the years and everything. So we're proud of that. And then we'll have another agriculturalist uh, of the year inducted in uh, in a couple of weeks at the Kiwanis Luncheon. Saw many of you last night at the Manti County Farm Bureau dinner, kind of kicking things off and everything. And that was great to, to see you there and all like that. Agriculture is doing quite well in Manti County. There was no trouble locally. We're under duress by uh, international laws right now of running restricted tariffs and uh, you know, regulations uh, on pesticides and labor used from offshore countries and all. And, it's really suppressing the market and making it more difficult uh, to grow vegetables. But here in Manti County, we lie in the middle of a nice sandy loamy soil that begins around southern Hillsborough County, runs all through eastern Manatee County and into parts of uh, southern Sarasota County. So as we're being you know, run off the farmland by these new subdivisions and everything, they're certainly going to have pretty landscaping around their houses because they have beautiful soils that they're building on right there. So I just want to leave you with a couple of quotes I always do. Unstable is the future of a country which has lost its taste for agriculture. Folks, if we can't eat, we're not going to function. That's basically said 200 plus years ago by Benjamin Franklin. And then by a man who doesn't mince many words. He's got a big old fat book of words. This is by Daniel Webster. Never let us forget that the cultivation of the land is the most important uh, for mankind. If there is one, one lesson in history which is unmistakable, it is that the national strength of a country lies near its soil. And I think that demonstrates over the past 200 and some years of the United States of America how great a country we've turned into with all the natural resources that God has blessed us all around the country and here in Manatee County. So again, thank you for saluting Farm City Week uh, again. It kicks off here in another couple of weeks and all like that. I hope you all participate in it. And uh, 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 Sayism by Ralph Garrison. Never speak poorly about the farmer if your mouth's full of food. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Baugh. Yeah, guys, I... Oh, are you done? Yeah, we're done. Okay. I didn't want to butt in. I just wanted to say I, I missed last night because I've been fighting a cold and I'm in my third week. And so I, I thought it was best that I didn't show up. But I really missed going. I'm so sorry I wasn't there because you guys know I love what you do. I love that you grow our food. Um, you know, and, and I can tell you, it, Ralph, you know, I always enjoy hearing your sayings, mm -hmm. always, you. every year. Yeah. Um, and interestingly enough, yesterday I was in a meeting, um, some two others uh, were as well with the MPO, and Christine Johnson got up and spoke about how important conservation was. Uh, it is important that we make sure that we take care of our farmers and that we keep our agriculture strong in Manatee County. So um, I just want you to know that even though we are leaving for Tallahassee after this meeting, I'm not, I'm, I might take that just so I can eat it in the car on the way, <laughs> just so you know. But I'm just, this is my favorite time when y'all go, you know, when you're here. I tell you that every year, and it's just a pleasure having you here again. Well, thank you. So thank you, and congratulations for another successful year. Thank you. And, and I wanted to say, <clears throat> we had the opportunity last week to be in Washington. We're moving so much, sometimes I'm not sure exactly That's where we I'm are sick. at any given point in time. But we did get a chance to hear from um, the Commissioner of Agriculture, Senator Purdue, which was uh, USDA. It was very interesting. There were uh, question and answer period. Catherine Starkey, <coughs> who um, some of you may know the Starkey family from Pasco County, she did ask him about the, the, the problems that, she's a blueberry grower, yeah. and she asked him about, 
and presented our concerns to, um, to him. And he was very aware. And other folks that were there from Alabama and Georgia also talked about problems that we're having. And you are so correct. I mean, we have to fight the good fight together. We have to make sure that we preserve our agriculture. It's a little bit different here in Manatee County than in Sarasota because we just really do have better soil. You know, and um, so I, I think it's great that you guys do keep it front and center with our young people and let them know how important this is. So, and I know uh, Commissioner Whitmore wanted to say something because I know she's ecstatic about your choice, <laughs> yeah. Carol. And the family had asked me to write a letter. Yeah, I don't know whoever selects them if you saw it um, in support. I'm very happy that you selected Scott. Uh, he, I've known him since we were young. I, he came probably in Manatee County in the late 70s, but he's been on the island since, and I know you've known him, Ralph. 52. But not on the island, has he? Oh, no, no, no. no. He yeah. came in the early yeah, 70s yeah, on the exactly. island. Yeah, exactly. But I knew you knew him, too, and um, this guy's done a lot for the conservation of our seafood, and, um, you know, there was always a rift between Cortez and the charter captains, and I think that they've all realized we all got to work together to save whatever we have left. And um, I remember years ago, uh, he took JFK Jr. out charter, cat, charter fishing, and his son Justin uh, got a $100 tip from JFK Jr., so that was kind of cool. But he's known all over the country, and, um, I, and he is a very um, down-to-earth man, and he works with everybody, and I know he works with all of you. So anytime there's something going on, he, he'll send me an email up the river. There's an issue going on, Carol. Pass it on to Charlie, whoever. Um, he's really, he really is out there for all of us. So I really appreciate it because I don't think we've done that and that I can remember. Have we? Is this the first time? I think we've uh, saluted uh, uh, commercial <laughs> fishermen before and everything like that, but we kind of run a cycle. And, yeah. and the committee decided this year we're going to go back to seafood, and that's where we came up with local catch as the theme. And so, yes, we are kind of highlighting the community of Cortez and, and such. We have our Sea Grant uh, agent with us also and everything. Angela uh, Collins. Yeah. What, Collins, isn't it? Angela uh, Collins. Yeah. She's with us and everything. And she's active. Uh, she's wonderful. Yes, yes she is. Wonderful. She is. You're right, Commissioner Whitmore. Again, thank you all very much and everything. As I mentioned, the farmers aren't, we have no, no risks right now with the county commissioners. We appreciate your support very much and everything. It's other entities that uh, Betsy was talking about up in Washington, and we share them with other states and other counties and this sort of thing that it just isn't a fair level of play right now. But we still have an abundance of uh, fruits and vegetables at all here in Manti County because of the soil. That's, That's right. the key. Like Thanks, that. Ralph. Thank you very much. Thank uh -huh. you. Thank you. All right. And next up, I, our, our ladies in purple, I believe, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. If you would like to come down and join Commissioner Servia, who's going to read the proclamation. Well, I, I recognize purple. the color. Huh? It was kind of easy, though. Really. to see you. Nice to meet you in person. <clears throat> oh, it's my honor. I love all this support. You brought everybody. Uh, we have 40 people. This is <laughs> um, good morning. So I did request from our chairman that I read this special proclamation because um, our family recently went through a very sad time uh, and was struck by domestic violence. But like with every sad time, it's always balanced with, and I'm going to use the word hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and there is so much so much good being done by the people behind me. So, whereas October is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and whereas incidents of domestic violence occur on average to nearly 20 people per minute in the United States, equating to more than 10 million women <coughs> and men per year, domestic violence is more than an occasional family dispute and occurs in all geographic, social, and economic backgrounds, and victims of domestic violence lose a total of 8 million days of paid work each year. <coughs> and whereas in 2018, according to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, 104,914 reports of domestic violence occurred in Florida and 2,000 
252 Manatee County domestic violence offenses were documented. And whereas a home should be a safe place, a residence of warmth, unconditional love, tranquility and security, and for most of us, home and family can be counted on counted among our greatest blessings. <coughs> and whereas in Manatee County, Hope Family Services, their staff, volunteers, and board members directly confront this local crisis with help from all law enforcement agencies, health care providers, the clergy, and other concerned citizens who are working together to aid in the effort to end domestic violence in our community. And we must recognize the compassion and dedication of these volunteers, staff, and professionals. Applaud their efforts and increase public understanding of this important issue. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County, Florida, that October 2019 shall be known, designated, and set aside as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Manatee County, Florida, adopted with a quorum present and voting this 22nd day of October 2019. And I'm so excited that there are so many people here to support this proclamation. <coughs> Laurel, did you want to say a few words? Do you know me? <laughs> Ask. Yeah, yeah, do you know. Would somebody else like to say a few no. words? No. Thank you. Thank you. Esteemed commissioners, I uh, thank you. I mean, from the bottom of my heart. Um, it's What stood out for me this morning as I was sitting here, um, it's a community issue, but we have a community solution. Pastor Clark did the invocation. He's a huge supporter of hope. He, um, our kids get to go to their VBS in the summer. Uh, they do an angel tree. I mean, and, and the Farm Bureau folks, we have a farm worker outreach program because as you well know, that lots of the farm workers have domestic violence too and they're so afraid to come to us. Mm -hmm. So we have an office now in Palmetto to make it more convenient for them near the packing houses where right. they can come and get help. So it's, I'm, I'm so proud to live and work and do this in Manatee County because the support we receive, I mean, we get a lot of credit. We have board members here this morning, staff, volunteers. We get a lot of credit for the work we do, but I have to tell you, we couldn't do it without you. And uh, <coughs> Administrator Corey, you and I go <clears throat> back a little ways. <laughs> when I first came to town 20-some years ago, I, I was five, in case you were wondering, and, um, and I think you were four. So um, you have supported us and helped us through growing pains and changes and results and all of that for many, many years. And I just have to say on behalf of the people whose lives you've saved, thank you. Thank you for everything you. you do. Yes. And these are the peeps who make it happen. I just get to come here and they're shy and I'm not, so. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, moving right along. We're gonna do a lifelong learning month. This is something that excites me and I look forward to participating throughout the rest of my life in learning. So um, if you folks would like to come forward, uh, Commissioner Bellamy is going to read the proclamation for us. As an educator, I figured he'd like it. Proclamation, Board of County Commissioners, Manatee County, Florida. Whereas, Manatee County is committed to supporting adults of all <coughs> ages as they take charge of their lives, including their health, social and intellectual well-being. And whereas, we recognize that adults are never too old to pursue knowledge and skills that will positively influence their mental and physical health, economic prospects, and social life. And whereas the variety of classes, lectures, and special events offered by Manatee County lifelong <laughs> learning organizations provide an excellent opportunity for engaging with others to enjoy the, mental, the many benefits of these pursuits. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County, Florida, that November the 20th, that November 2019 shall be known, designated, and set aside as Lifelong Learning Month in Manatee County, adopted with the quorum present and voting this 22nd day of October, Board of County Commissioners, and signed by our chair, Stephen R. Johnson. Thank you very much. Uh, 
as food is presented to us in the fall, we think of the wonderful, bountiful results of farming. There is also this eagerness to continue to renew ourselves intellectually or gain new skills or be exposed to new ideas. And that's what lifelong learning is all about. I have two representatives here from the historical village in Manatee County, Catherine Rowling and Rachel Desrosio. And they represent one of the five organizations that are members of the Suncoast Alliance for Lifelong Learning, of which I am president. We have, uh, there's about 50 organizations between Sarasota and Manatee County that present classes of, of a variety, lectures, special events like conferences and so forth. And about half of those belong to the Sun Coast Alliance for Lifelong Learning. Uh, we continue to try to reach out to each of those organizations because what we think we can provide is make it easy for you, people like yourselves and myself to find something that you may be interested in. Our website is a one of those one-stop, one-shop kind of websites where you can search and find out what's available among the member organizations. And uh, you can connect to them, you can register, you can pay. The, we're trying to make it easy. And plus we also do uh, a, uh, an expo, and the expo does the same thing. We bring all the members together, we bring a panel on different subjects, and we try to celebrate the nature of uh, lifelong learning and provide, again, the public, increase their awareness of what's going on around them. In my travels, and I don't know about your experience, but what I found as I travel across the country, you may find a university or a college that will offer some lifelong learning, but you won't find the breadth that we have in these two county areas. When I say 50 organizations, those are ones that I'm familiar with. I, st I think there's still some others out there that I'm not aware of and not included in my list. Why do they do that? I think that it's serving the community. It's trying to meet the needs of people who live and interesting enough, move here. I encounter continuously individuals who say, one of the reasons I moved to Manatee or Sarasota County is because there's a rich number of opportunities to take classes, um, develop certain skills, uh, meet other people, you know, create kind of social circles of, around uh, subject matter that seems to be of interest. I know I got started with uh, a course on the brain, and I'm still attending a monthly meeting with about a dozen of us who discuss all the things that are happening around research on the brain. And I <clears throat> may have not gotten any smarter, but at least I know what's going on that's of very interest to all of us. I just want to mention that here in Bradenton, in, in Manatee County, the Manatee Village Historical Park, the Florida Maritime Museum at Cortez, the Manatee County Historical Records Library, the Manatee County Agricultural Museum, and the Palmetto Historical Park are part of the Sun Coast Alliance for Lifelong Learning and the Bishop Museum as well. And you, if you're in the farmer's market over the next month or so, you, we will be there trying to dis, uh, distribute some literature on these organizations and also on the Sun Coast Alliance for Lifelong Learning, trying to inform the public because when we've done this in the past, people come by and they'll say, oh, I didn't realize we had these things at our, in our neighborhood, so to speak, at our doorstep. And uh, that's, that's what we're dedicated to do. Uh, and your proclamation helps reinforce this. It gives us a, 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 a lift to, uh, to publicize more further, further in, the, in the area. And um, uh, hopefully, as you have time yourselves, you can take advantage of some of the opportunities that are here in your own community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to it. Good job. Yeah.
Okay. Um, the last proclamation is one that I will be presenting on Sunday. It is the recognition of the 170th, 170th anniversary of the founding of the uh, Manatee United Methodist Church. And for those of you who don't know, that is my church. <laughs> and it is the oldest church on the um, west coast of Florida between Tampa and north of Key West. Oh. So, and has been in continuous existence all of that time. Um, the uh, historic buildings are part of the Manatee Village Historical Park. Um, but this uh, weekend we are going to be celebrating. We've been celebrating this whole month. Um, so I look forward to reading this proclamation and I thank you all for supporting it. And when you supported me when I changed our rules to say that we could recognize any church that was over 160 years old. <laughs> so, and I think there's only one, so I do appreciate that, but um, it's important that, to recognize churches that have been around in continuous existence for this long in this community, such a big part of our community. So thank you. Okay. Um, oh. I'm not gonna read it today. Okay. Unless you all wanna hear it, I'll be glad to read it if you want me to. Every uh, you could read it up here if you want. I will re if you want me to read it, I, I will. I mean, we read them all, okay. all the others. I will read it right here. <laughs> Except for I just shut it, so I have to open it back up. Proclamation, Board of County Commissioners, Manatee County, For Florida. Whereas the area that became known as Manatee County, known as the Manatee Lands, was opened up for settlement in 1842 under the Armed Occupation Act that gave 160 acres of land to settlers who would live in the area for five years, build a house, clear five acres, and serve in the militia. And whereas a few of those early Florida pioneering families who established the Manatee Village settlement started worshiping in their homes in 1842, and in 1849 founded the Manatee Episcopal, Ch Manatee Episcopal Methodist Church, and whereas the church was the first Christian congregation established in Florida, south of Tampa and north of Key West. And whereas the history of the church is closely tied to this community. The first meeting place was built in 1850. The congregation subsequently purchased the Manatee County Courthouse in 1866 and moved it near their current location. In 1887, construction began on a third house of worship and the current sanctuary was built in 1975. The early church buildings are now located on the grounds of the Manatee Village Historical Park, and the church building that was built in 1887 is listed on the Methodist Register of Historic Places. And whereas the congregation will be celebrating the 170th anniversary of its founding on October 27, 2019, now therefore be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County, Florida, hereby recognizes the historic significance of the 170th anniversary of Manatee United Methodist Church, adopted with a quorum present and voting this 22nd day of October 2019, signed by our chairman. So on behalf of the church, I say thank you. Okay, uh, back to our agenda. We've got a little bit of time, so we're gonna keep moving right along to the next item, which is? Sure. This is citizen comments on uh, future agenda items. I have a few people that are signed up. I think you probably will recognize a few of these people that are signed up today. Oh, and that's true. I do. I forgot that we do pull consent agenda items. Does any of the commissioners have any items they want to pull from the consent agenda so we can let staff know? Uh, yes, Madam Chairman. I would like just to pull item number 13 for a couple of questions and comments. Okay, so item 13, um, so staff will need to come back at 1130 for that item. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? Um, Madam Administrator, did we address the issue concerning pedestrian, um, the pedestrian or ordinance? It, it's uh, No, sir, it's under the um, it's on the regular hearings. agenda. Public okay. uh, yeah. the regular presentations agenda. upon progress oh. public hearings. So. Okay, so the only item to be polled will be item 13. Okay, we'll go ahead and go to citizens' comments on future agenda items. First up, I have Cynthia Kahn to be followed by Karen Ankerstar. And would you like to come forward, please? Good morning, commissioners. 
My name is Cynthia Kahn. An ordinance to ban the sale of puppies and kittens in our county will not affect any local home-based breeder, sometimes called hobby breeder. In fact, such an ordinance would only encourage customers to turn to local home hobby breeders or rescues. The only impact this ordinance would have on a local home breeder would be to increase their business. Reputable, responsible local breeders and breeder clubs should be grateful for an ordinance where pet stores can no longer sell puppies. These stores are their competition. This ordinance does not pertain to the American Kennel Club or any of the breeder clubs. Breeder clubs in their code of ethics Breeder clubs say in their code of ethics that breeders should never sell their pups to pet stores. Club members have a reputation to uphold. Club ethics demand member breeders vet their customers. They have the customer agree to return the dog any time in the future should the customer not be able to care for the dog. Stores would never do this. Hobby breeding is not driven by money. It is driven by the love and respect for animals. In direct opposition is the pet store business model, driven by greed. This business is completely inhumane. As you have seen with the USDA inspection reports and photos, the animal's comfort, veterinary care, and socialization are completely ignored. The store wants to buy a cheap product from a dog farm to sell at an exorbitant price. Financing is encouraged, so they get that money up front. Again, greed is the name of the game. These are just a few of the reasons the Journal of American Veterinary Medicine says this, quote, due to behavior and health studies of store puppies, they could not recommend puppies be obtained from stores. A ban on the product of store puppies is a benefit to the dogs, local home breeders, defrauded customers, and our county's reputation. A clean ban has nothing to do with home breeders, breeder clubs, or the AKC. I listened to the farmer. Uh, he had some cute sayings that I agree with, and I have one too. Profiting from animal abuse is never okay. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Karen? She's got her timing down. Good time. She must <laughs> practice. She's professional. I'm back. Karen Anchorstar, regarding a proposed retail pet sales ordinance. Today I will provide you with a document from a Sarasota Petland customer. It is a <coughs> non disclosure agreement, in effect, a gag order. For the privacy of the person involved, the names are redacted. It states, and I quote, in order to receive this assistance, you must agree to re cease refrain from all forms of slander, negative comments, and feedback on all platforms of social media, mm. such as Facebook, Twitter, Yelp, Instagram, or any such avenue. This includes, but not limited to, other venues such as the Better Business Bureau and reports to the Attorney General, unquote. This so-called assistance is the reimbursement the customer is legally due, yet Petland refused to pay the reimbursement unless the document was signed. This gag order was given to the owner of a puppy who died shortly after purchase from the Parkers at Sarasota Petland. According to Florida Pet Law, Petland should have refunded the cost of the puppy and the veterinary bills incurred, yet they refused to pay unless the customer signed the document. You might ask Petland, why do you silence your customers? The answer, of course, is simple. Petland does not want people to know they are selling sick and dying puppies. So I ask Petland, I ask you today, what about the silenced ones? How many others are there who have bought a sick or dying puppy? Must they all sign a gag order to get the money they are due? Commissioners, is this the type of business you want to protect? I think not. Those of you who are concerned about affecting a business, remember, we are not asking the two pet lands to close. We are asking them to change their business model and sell the pet supplies they already have, not puppies. Petland, yes, Petland in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, has not sold puppies for 11 years and they are still thriving. 
Other pet lands across the country do the same. The two in Manatee can follow. You regulate businesses all the time. Some of the regulations are not well liked, but that is how we keep up our county standards. With pet stores, the only thing that has worked is a ban on selling puppies and kittens. That is why over 300 places across the country have passed a clean ban ordinance. The few, and they are very few, where they have tried to regulate where the puppies come from or how many violations the breeders have, it is still business as usual. Any regulation other than a ban is unenforceable. Please, let's join the places that care about the quality of the business their city or county supports. And I've got a handout. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy Thank you. Johnson, be uh, followed by Betty Sales Rhodes. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Nancy Johnson, and I've lived 15 years in Lakewood Ranch. I understand that as Commissioners, your duties to your constitu constituents include regulating what is best for their health, safety, and welfare. Let's talk about health, safety, and welfare. You've been provided with the class action lawsuit recently filed against Petland, owned by Brad Parker. The risk to humans by bringing sickly dogs into a community is certain. Brad Parker knowingly continued to purchase puppies from the breeder with the diseased puppies, at least through October 25, 2018. He continued nine months after his employee almost died. He could still be doing that. Remember, there is no transparency from the USDA. In Sarasota, Mr. Parker blatantly ignored Judge Mercurio and the commissioners by continuing to sell puppies after his injunction request was denied. Parker broke the law every day for two and a half years. Furthermore, he knew an ordinance was being discussed in Sarasota before he bought that pet land. The commissioners had graciously offered a compromise, giving pet land one year in lieu of six months to stop selling puppies and kittens. That good faith was ignored by Mr. Parker. Additionally, both your 53rd Avenue pet land and Parker's pet land ignore Florida pet law deceiving customers with their so-called warranty, which is in conflict with the law. Both pet lands tell the customers they do not buy from puppy mills, which is untrue. Do these two businesses cause concern for the health, safety, and welfare of your constitu constituents? Health and safety should be a concern because of the antibiotic resistance brought in with farmed puppies. Welfare should be a concern for the pet land customers who unknowingly purchase a sick dog or a dying dog. They are told it came from a reputable breeder only to accrue thousands of dollars in vet bills and to have a puppy that soon dies. The next person that contracts Campylobacter may well come from one of your pet lands. Though you may not be legally responsible, having this prior knowledge, you may have a moral responsibility. To the south, Sarasota County has banned the retail sale of dogs and cats. To the east, DeSoto County, and to the north, St. Pete have done the same. You are close to being <coughs> surrounded. If you don't stop the current importation of hundreds, if not thousands, of puppies, Manatee County will become the puppy mill capital of southwest Florida. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Thank you. Betty Sales Roads, to be followed by Terry Passarelli. Good morning. Good morning. I'm here about um, Lincoln Park Pool. Uh, we went to a meeting last night, and what we're trying to find out, I know you can't answer for me today to take back to my committee, but y'all <clears throat> about have Shirley Groover Bryant sign the paperwork that need to be done for this pool to start. Now, the pool's supposed to be finished the end of this year, 2019, and you all... Every commission was up here except for one person. Y'all signed for this pool to be built, and it should be built, not no 2021 like you all say. And, um, but from my understanding, she said that she waiting on Manatee County to send the paperwork. And we just wonder what is going on because the pool need to be built. 
and you all did it's time for it to be built. And another thing, because I know it should be built because, like, Palmetto High School have a swim team. And I know they're getting tired of getting up early in the morning to go practice where they can get a pool at over here in Bradenton. And you all shouldn't worry about the parking space because, listen, I go to football games sometime at the GT Bray, and they don't have no parking space out there, and they have a pool. So y'all need to stop joking with that. Y'all need to get on this pool. You need to build it for the kids over and north of the river. It looked like some of y'all forget about the people over north of the river, and we are somebody. And I've always been somebody. I know my committee, too. So I know you all have time to say it because you all have a lot on your agenda. But you all need to let us know. Is the mayor the hold up or are you all the hold up of this pool being built? Because we were going to be shouting December in the December because our pool supposed to be built. And that's the bottom line. So that's all I got to say to you all, and I will be waiting, me and my committee, to see what is going on <coughs> with this pool. And y'all need to get it done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sherry, did you I want to I can help with an answer, Ms. Rhodes. Okay. I can give you an answer now. Um, the Lincoln Pool is under design. Mm -hmm. The design is just beyond 30% design. We did receive a letter from... Mayor Bryant um, late last week, and that's being <coughs> forwarded to the board um, later today. I uh, did speak with the mayor at around noon yesterday, and that is uh, in that letter in writing, it did basically um, indicate that the CRA, Palmetto CRA and the city council we're now ready for us to proceed with pr putting together an agreement mm -hmm. to help with the funding. And I spoke with the county attorney about that yesterday. So there'll be agreement coming. But the const the design is already underway, mm -hmm. and it is a little over 30% um, completed. So that will continue to 100%. And once that is all completed and presented, then the actual construction can begin. Okay. Will you let us know sure. that people north of the river know, have something in the paper, or either, I know Ms. Whitmore is a, a commission at large, and I know Bellamy have district two. Somebody need to call a meeting, because we are getting very frustrated over there about that pool. Uh, do we have your address on your sheet that you provided? Is there an address for? Uh, Reggie can find her. No. Okay. But, um, <laughs> oh, I live right in the county. I just want, I can no, send. No, she just wants to be able to, to know you. Okay. So. Yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> sure. yeah. I put my email, but I know her real well. I work with her. Right. Okay. okay. Years okay. ago. All yes. right, good. I know, Commissioner Bellamy, did you want to make a comment before yes. we? Yes, a couple of, a couple of things. Uh -huh. Ms. Rose to follow up. Um, I was encouraged last night when I received a phone call from the county administrator about the communication that came from the mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a very exciting um, conversation. Um, I do have a town hall um, on November the 21st. November the 21st? Yes, on the, at Pathways Christian. When I first um, was elected, uh, people were calling for a, a town hall, and I said I wasn't going to have one until I went through a complete year. Okay. I got sworn in on November the 20th, so November the 21st, okay, uh, I have it. It'll be at 6.30, 6.30, 6.30 to 8.00, and I will have both pool options um, there. Thank you. I have Thank both you. pool options there along with some other information, but Thank the encouraging you. thing that came um, yesterday, I think the city of Palmetto is looking at option two from the information that I have, but I, on November the 21st, I'm going to let... Um, the community know ab about the both of the options and where we're going, and then some other information that I'm sure that the county administrator have. But she did so tell good. us last night that when she received the paperwork back, she will sign it. So right. Well, the commission. I signed. am like on the executive committee, so they put me here to come okay. to okay. ask the question, and that's my address. And you can write and let me know. But I will let the committee know November the 21st yes. at 6:30. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Look nice forward to it. Uh, we look forward to the grand opening as mu almost as much as We're you trying can. To get okay. almost. We are trying to get there. <laughs> and and, Bet right. and Betsy is your commissioner, too. There's two of us. You are, actually three Betsy's of us. at large. I'm at large. And Reggie's yours. Well, I know you. I know. Mm. Thank okay. you. Thank All right. Uh, Terry Passarelli, if you'd like to come forward. Uh, 
good morning, commissioners. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my name is Terry Passarelli, Manatee County. Uh, I'm going to uh, give some statements, falsehoods from retail pet stores. Uh, false. Puppy mills are breeders operating without a USDA license. The truth is, a puppy mill is dog farming, disregarding the health of the dogs in order to maintain low overhead to maximize profits. It's also the definition of the USDA license breeders you may have been shown. Pet stores are, by definition, puppy mill outlets. False. These ordinances are anti-small business. The truth is, the ordinances promote businesses that reflect the character of the county. Case in point, Petland in Fort Walton Beach, Florida stopped selling puppies 11 years ago and thrives to this day. False statement, we only get our dogs from responsible breeders, the best of the best. The truth, commissioners, you've already seen the sources of the manatee store puppies for yourselves. So you can be the judges of this one. False, instead of prohibiting pet stores sales, work with us to make sure we buy from the best breeders, give us more regulations. The truth is this would require constant oversight. It'd be overly bureaucratic, costly, and unenforceable. This policy could attract more pet stores and incur, incur more cost to the county. False. Puppies sold online are unregulated. The truth is, in fact, breeders selling over the internet have been licensed and regulated the same as suppliers to pet stores since 2013. False. The public should buy from the stores because of consumer protection. Well, the truth is, the documentation previously shown to you of consumer complaints show the stores have not consistently abided by Florida's pet lemon law. Few citizens even know of the existence of Florida pet laws. False, pet store puppies are healthy. Well, the truth is, just tell this to the sick plaintiffs in the class action suit against the Parkers. The Journal of American Veterinary Medicine says this, due to behavior and health studies of store puppies, they can't recommend puppies be obtained from pet stores. False. The ordinance will limit consumer options. The, the truth is, PetFinder.com shows over 2,000 adoptable, adoptable dogs, and AKC Puppy Finder shows 72 breeders, all within an hour's drive. The facts support when the stores stop selling, adoptions go up. Euthanasia you. goes down. That's what your voters want for our county now. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure we will see you on Halloween. Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. See you on the 31st. <laughs> the okay. <laughs> Should be interesting. All right. We're going to go ahead and move to item number 58. This is a quasi-judicial item, so um, I'm going to read the, into the record the title. It's... Z1924 House of Trikes and Bikes Rezone at 6823 14th Street West. Um, and uh, we're going to go ahead and have people sworn in. Anyone who wishes to speak before the board on this matter, please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and representations you're about to make to the board are truthful and accurate? Thank you. When you step to the podium, please state your name and if you have been sworn. We're going to have introductory comments by the BADS department, by the planner. If you'd like to introduce the item, please come forward. Is it, I'll have to ask, has there been any um, ex parte communication by any of the commissioners? Any ex parte communication? No. The record show now? Item number 58, Z1924, House of Trikes and Bike Rezone, 6823 14th Street West. Number, project number PLN 1908-0051. I'd like to move forward to the applicant. 
Okay. First for presentation. Yes. What's your name? Sorry, I'm sorry. Tracy Trahan with Building and Development Services. Okay, thank you. Go ahead and move, move to the applicant. Please come forward and state your name for the record. Good morning. I am Patricia Petroff. I represent the property owner. I have been sworn. Um, this is an interesting case. Uh, my client, before they bought the property, uh, met many times with the planning department staff, and uh, everyone thought that only an administrative permit would be required to uh, do what needed, what they wanted to do on the property. Um, as it turns out, the property in 1998 was zoned general commercial. The property owner, the then property owner, which was the carpet store, the carpet store owner, wanted to expand the building by, I think, 5,900 square feet. In accordance with the codes that existed in 1998, that would have resulted in an FAR, floor area ratio, of uh, too, great, too great of a floor area ratio. So in order to resolve that issue with the owner, the planning department back then uh, suggested that they go to a plan development commercial uh, because in the plan development commercial, as you all are aware, you have some flexibility with floor area ratios. And so that's what happened and the resulting approval in, uh, of that request basically linked, you know, resounded to plan development commercial and linked it to a site plan that only showed a carpet store. <laughs> um, I regret to say that I think we're going to find other, other PDC and PDR zonings like that, and I regret to say that my name might be on some of them, <laughs> um, because we didn't consider, I don't think at that time, I think when it went to whatever the zoning district was without a site plan, when the site plan expired, I think in that era, everyone thought that you could use it for any of the other PDR or PDC or PDI uses. That's not the interpretation today. And so, unfortunately, my client closed on the property, and then this was discovered, this issue was discovered. So what, uh, why we're here today is to just rezone it back to general commercial, which is what the zoning had been from the get-go, basically, all the surrounding properties are zoned general commercial. I would note that the property to the east has been developed for numerous years as some sort of uh, single-level, looks like apartment living, apartment complexes. Um, there is a fence on that side. There is a fence between this property and the property to the north, which is where the Beauty Academy was recently permitted to go. Um, I understand that that gentleman had some issues about noise. We don't believe <coughs> that there will be any noise because the nature of the business is it's called House of Trikes. It is a business that sells several brands of trucks several brands of motorcycles and the three-wheel trikes that are becoming more popular for those people who are in my age range that used to ride motorcycles. Um, the, you, the, there will be warranty repair at the facility, but the warranty repair is generally done under roof because of just the nature of, of the size of the, of the bicycles and the trikes. Um, so we don't anticipate there will be any noise issue, and if even if there is, the county already has noise ordinance in place to deal with that. In doing the legal research on this property, um, I discovered that before the carpet store was there, uh, there was a use that looked like some sort of boat building or manufacturing, because I have an aerial photograph that shows boat hulls all over the property. So it's not as if this property hasn't been used for a myriad of uses in the past. Um, this commission or the staff uh, recently approved a final site plan for a uh, 
property that was within the notice requirements called uh, Manatee Motor Works, which also allows some uh, neighborhood, commercial, neighborhood vehicle repair. So it's not a, a unknown use in this area. We're right on US 41. It's a very good location for this. The Carpet Depot uh, store, uh, the owner basically, I, I guess, closed his business. You know, if he didn't sell his business to a new, new person, he ran a carpet store f for 20, 20 years or so, and the business closed, and the uh, building has been empty for quite some time. The Planning Commission recommended approval. The staff recommended approval. Uh, we would like to move to the next step of getting final site plan approval so that uh, my client can... Uh, complete whatever remodel would be necessary and open the business. They have a similar business in, in I believe, Fort Myers. And um, it is, yeah, Fort Myers. And that at that location, they sell Royal Enfield bikes, Indian motorcycles, Hondas, and these trikes. Um, and there is a demand in this area for that type of business. And we respectfully request that you approve this. It meets all of your requirements, all of the setbacks. I mean, everything is met. And since 1998, you have changed the FAR for general commercial. And so it will even meet those requirements. I'm happy to answer any questions. A uh, representative of the owner is here. And um, the architect for the project is here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Serby has a question. Yes, um, thank you very much for your presentation. And, you know, like you, Patty, I hope that my name is not on any of these problems that we now are, have identified, right? Because it just shows you how when processes change and mm -hmm. procedures change and, it, you know, we run into these issues. But I want to take a moment to thank the property owner for his patience. I really do appreciate that. Um, I am excited that you're going to be in my district. And uh, I just want to thank you very much for your patience and willingness to go through this process. Yeah, and, I, and I'll just say it's, a, I guess, a comment as much as a question that the the issue of, you know, expanding the floor area, I mean, our, our comp plan was written that way with, you know, these base numbers, and any time you went over them, you had to go plan development. So that you always got kicked into plan development, and we've realized going through the process some of the unintended consequences and how they affect property and don't really benefit anyone, <coughs> doesn't benefit the neighborhood by having those kind of limitations. So, um uh, it, Patty, is there a buffer of any kind between the residential, which I don't know when that was built on general commercial, and, and this property? Is there any kind of a buffer back there? There, there is somewhat of a buffer. It is in somewhat disarray uh, because there's been nobody on the property. There is a fence, but um, as part of the final site plan process, you know, your, all of your rules and regulations with respect to some of those issues will have to be um, reviewed and resolved. Okay. Well, I would hope because uh, between a commercial and a residential use, I would hope there's some sort of buffer requirement. I'm not asking for space, but maybe <coughs> plants or something. Hopefully that yeah, is. There, there are some planting there, but it's uh, it probably needs some tender, loving care. Okay, any other questions for the applicant? All right, we'll go ahead and go to staff presentation. Good morning, Tracy Trahan, Senior Planner with Manatee County Building and Development Services, and I have been sworn. Okay. Patty gave you most of the information, so I'll make this as brief as possible. Uh, this is for House of Trikes and Bikes at 6823 14th Street West. Here's the location of the site. As you can see, it's along 14th Street. The property was previously zoned, uh, was previously zoned uh, general commercial, and it was rezoned to plan development commercial. The preliminary site plan was also approved during the rezone to expand the existing carpet store by 5,900 square feet. 
At the time, uh, special approval was granted to exceed the floor area ratio. Uh, at the time, the current threshold was 0.25, and the applicant was seeking a 0.3. The future land use category of the project is ROR. Uh, at the time, or I'm sorry, recently we've made changes to allow for a greater FAR in this uh, future land use category. Currently, the regulation is 0.5 uh, along this corridor, and if they meet the urban corridor standards, they could actually go up to a 1, and then with the approved FAR bonuses, they could go up to a 2. Zoning for the property is planned development commercial. As you can see, it's surrounded by all general commercial zoning. The applicant's request is to re rezone the property back to general commercial. Here are some of the site characteristics of the property. Uh, currently, there's a 14,145 square foot structure on the site. It's currently serviced by Manatee County Water and Sewer. It's located in the, the X flood zone. Some of the surrounding uses uh, to the north, it was previously uh, an office. It's recently been shoot changed to a school of special education. That's the beauty school that, mm -hmm. that Patty was referencing. To the east is a multifamily residential uh, established, we believe, around the 80s. And then to the south is currently a furniture store. And to the west, uh, across from 14th Street, is a shopping center. Some of the positive aspects is uh, the rezone to general commercial will provide for a diverse schedule of uses, which is consistent with the adjacent and surrounding developments. The rezone provides for a logical expansion of the surrounding general commercial zoning district and completes the general commercial zoning along the segment of 14th Street West. Uh, one of the negative aspects is it is adjacent to that residential use that we discussed. Uh, however, the Multifamily residential has been in the area for quite a while, and it's been compatible with all the neighboring commercial uses. Some of them include auto repair, warehouse, retail store, medical office, uh, the new hair salon. Uh, Planning Commission did recommend approval, and staff also recommends approval. And I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions for staff? Okay, you're off the hook. All right. <laughs> Good presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, Commissioner Servia, did you have a question? Um, just when the time is right after we hear from the public, I'd like to make the motion for approval. Okay, sure. All right, we'll go ahead and go to public uh, comment. Is there anyone who would like to uh, make a public comment regarding this application? All right, seeing no one come forward, we're going to go ahead and close public comment. Any other questions or any other information needed? Rebuttal? Anything? Staff? Anything? We're all good? Okay. Uh, Misty. Uh, based upon the staff report evidence presented, comments made at the public hearing and the action of the Planning Commission of finding the request to be consistent with the Manatee County Conference of Plan, Manatee County Land Development Code, I move to adopt Manatee County Zoning Ordinance Z1924 as recommended by the Planning Commission. Second. second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Chair votes on motion passes. And again, you know, I guess I can say sorry to the property owner that you had to jump through these hoops, but you know, such is government. So we're glad we could take care of it and get you on your way to uh, building your um, business here. So thank you. Good luck. Uh, Chair, I wasn't here, but I did want to state that I had no ex parte communication. Oh, thank you. Okay, for the record. Okie dokie, so where the heck are we? All right, we're on the uh, consent agenda. Is there anyone um, in the public that'd like to make a comment on anything that is on the consent agenda? We have pulled item number 13. I think that is the only change. Mm -hmm. uh, Sherry? I'm sorry, we do have one additional change that's come to my attention, um, working back and forth with the county attorney. Okay. We'd like to defer item number 62, which was the added item. Um, that I read into the record this uh, this morning. And let me just mention to you that that is a Parks and Natural Resources item on the execution of the conservation easement for the Southwest Florida Water Management District for the Ungarelli Preserve. We need, we need to um, work back and forth with the county attorney's office on a full review. 
Okay. Sorry for that. Thank you. All right. Well, you, you gave it your best shot to get her done and ran into a hiccup. So, All right. So item number 62 is being uh, deferred, and item number 13 will come up at um, 1130. What's the pleasure of the board? Move we uh, accept the consent agenda minus 13 and 62. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to accept the consent agenda. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed nay, chair votes aye, motion passes. Okay, moving right along. Healthcare advisory board appointments. We have three and three. Three and three. Three <laughs> vacancies and three applicants. I'll Joshua, do you have motion. anything you want to add? Approval. Good morning, board. Joshua Barnett, healthcare services manager. Nothing more to add. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the second. three. All right, we have a motion for the slate, which includes substance abuse, Lisa McCoy, social services, Geneva Perche, yes. and business, Jill Sherbaugh. Sure sure and uh, we appreciate everyone who's willing to be reappointed. I know you all are doing good work. We have a lot of issues in this community, so appreciate all the leadership. Anything else, Joshua, you want to say? Uh, we appreciate the dedication of this board, and there are two reapplicants, so we appreciate you reappointing them for continuation. No, thank you very much. Anyone. Okay. Take um, care. Sherry, did you have anything you want to nope. add? Nope. Okay. Thank you. We have a motion and a second for the slate that include the three that I read. All those in um, favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Okie dokie. Um, the heck, where are we? Uh, all right, 56, ordinance, yes. Ordinance 19-41, pedestrian safety within public roads and rights of way. Uh, county attorney. Mm. County attorney Catherine Zamboni, assistant county attorney. Yes, uh, good morning, um, commissioners, county administrator and county attorney. So before you today is um, a proposal or ordinance number 1941 to amend provisions of the Manatee County Code, specifically Article 7 of Chapter 2-21, to further prohibit certain activities that interfere with public safety and the primary purpose of those public roads and rights of way. Um, because the board has already discussed a lot um, of the issues regarding this ordinance, um, I don't have a presentation pre prepared, but I could walk through what the ordinance would do if adopted and entertain any questions you have. All right, would y'all like a uh, present short presentation of what it's in, in the ordinance? Uh, Commissioner Bellamy? I'm not necessarily, I don't, wasn't anticipating a um, presentation. I said this yesterday in my briefing um, because of the conversation and all of the connectivity with this, I was wondering do we need to address this now? Do we need to have a continuance because of so much that's involved with it? And that's what I was wondering. I brought that up in my briefing and we discussed that. And I actually talked to Kate about it also. But I can hear from the board. I just want everybody to think. Um, Kate, did you wanna respond in any way? Well, again, you know, this item can take as much time as you wanna put into it. I don't know if there's people from the public that want to um, address it, but, and I wasn't aware about the short meeting at the time that the ordinance got advertised. So if you want to, obviously, if the board wants to continue the public hearing to a future date, that's your prerogative to do. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and hear from all the commissioners and then we'll hear from the public. That's very fair. Um, Commissioner Servia? Yes, thank you. Um, I want to thank you very much for bringing this back uh, for a vote. You know, if you all remember, we did discuss this ordinance, mm -hmm. and it has not changed substantially since our discussion, is my understanding. Um, I think it's a very important ordinance. Um, I'm so pleased um, that it is before us today, and I am ready to make the motion for approval on this ordinance as recommended. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, uh, Commissioner Whitmore. Uh, and and if the, for the public, because I understand, uh, maybe just no, nothing, uh, just basically so the public can hear, because we've been reading it, we've had our briefings, but for the public, I think they, you should at least, because this is an important ordinance that we've been working on. Sure, and, and really in the content of the ordinance, um, it's labeled Section 3, and it's the amendment to um, what's codified as Section 2-21-104. There was language about prohibiting 
um, previously it talked about soliciting or attempting to solicit employment, business, contributions, donations, or sales or exchanges. And it's been revised to be a little bit more simply worded to um, prohibit engaging in any physical re interaction, including the transfer of money or any product. Um, the Sheriff's Office supported the change. It's a little cleaner and um, gets away from targeting um, people that are engaged in, in panhandling specifically, but any kind of physical interaction. And again, goes to the primary purpose of the amendment, which is to keep people out of the traveled portions of the roadway, regardless of why they're there. Yeah, and I, I um, I'm next on the board. I, um, this is, you know, we had a we had a workshop yesterday, and I wish y'all would have been there. I know that sometimes y'all don't get notice um, of MPO workshops and and what they're going to entail, but it was a really good long term planning workshop, and we talked about the growth and how to accommodate growth. And it's clear the, <laughs> and this probably comes as no surprise, one of the best way to accommodate growth is to intensify in our urban area. You know, this intensification is going to result in more pedestrian activity. There's just no doubt about it. it. It seems counterintuitive, but as you do allow for a mix of uses and more uses in the urban area, you're going to have a lot more pedestrian activity. Well, that pedestrian activity is going to, you know, raise conflicts, and we just have to be able to make it as safe as we can. We also know that our population is getting older. We need to make sure we don't create conflicts, that we, we mitigate these. So I, I am very much in support of this ordinance. W you know, we know this is not going to solve the panhandling issue. We know that, that that's an issue that we have that is much bigger, much broader. So I really appreciate the separation here. Let's deal with the issue that we have, which is the public safety issue. And then the bigger issue, the panhandling issue, we're going to have to go forward. Not, and I, I said it before, I was thrilled to hear the discussion, the fact that we went way beyond this idea that we could simply stop panhandling. And we looked at some ways that we might be able to reduce those kind of problems. But um, that's going to take a lot more work, a lot more discussion. How are we going to do that? And I know we've asked for that um, discussion to continue. So I want to say thank you to the county attorney's office for putting this together. I am in support of it. Um, Commissioner Trace, you're next. I just have a quick question. Um, who actually would give a permit or a license in our county? Well, the county does not have a permit or licensing program for those activities. Um, that language was in the prior version of the ordinance simply to capture any other governmental entity that might have authority to issue a permit. You know, we were thinking primarily of the Department of Transportation. I know that's called out specifically, but um, if they have a need to be in, in within a roadway that would otherwise be prohibited, we needed to be able to accommodate okay. their activities. I understand that. The only thing I have when I read it, I'm for the, the uh, ordinance. It just it makes it seem like if you do want to do something, thus the firemen or something, that you could come to the county and get a permit. I mean, it kind of reads that way, that there's somewhere that you can go to get a permit. Well, it doesn't talk about Manatee County, though. It says, except when a permit or license has been issued by an appropriate governmental entity or otherwise authorized by the rules of the Florida Department of Transportation. I guess it could leave open the um, chance if, if the county were inclined to create such a permit program, but we do not have one. Okay. I'm not inclined right yeah. at the second myself, but, yeah. and, and, you know. And we do have right-of-way use permits that are for different things, not That's for... True approaching people, but there is the existing process of right-of-way use permits, so I kind of thought this was referring to that. I wasn't thinking about, you know, somebody else, but yeah, that's a good question. Oh, well, I think they do have one in Sarasota, is why I asked that. Yeah, they that, do. That you can get a permit to... But we don't do that. They yeah. do. Legally panhandle, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we are not proposing that with this one. No, I, don't, I do not recommend that approach. No. But it's just saying that it's not prohibited to go get one from... Somebody. Well, again, it's it's what is allowed in the right of way, and I, I believe we're trying to be as clear as we can that what is allowed in the right of way doesn't include uh, any interaction with the driver. Just you're, you just get to cross the road. That is what is allowed in our right of way. So, I'm, I'm yeah. fine with it. I'm not saying I just to me it's a little. You know, it sounds like there is a place to go and get a permit for some people. Okay. Well, for example, parades get permitted. Right. Um, and so, um, so there are limited circumstances where permits will be issued for the use of a public right-of-way. 
But, oh. but yeah, yeah, to, to be very clear, this government does not have a permitting program in place for panhandling, nor is one being proposed. All right. Did we have a Commissioner Serbia? Yes, just one question about um, if this is adopted today, when will it be effective? Um, usually right away, we submit it to the Department of State um, pretty quickly, and that is the effective um, date set forth in the ordinance. So It's all done electronically these days, so this ordinance will be in effect probably within the space of about 48 hours. Yeah. Okay, thank it you. It happens very quickly. Thank you. Okay. No more questions. Uh, Carol? Uh, so we'll let our, even though they have their own jurisdictions, we'll let our police departments know department in the cities because they need to know that that we've done this? Yeah, I've been working very closely with the attorneys for the city of Bradenton and the city of Palmetto, so I will give them a courtesy copy of what is adopted if, if it passes. three other cities on the island, too, just because yes. they have interlocal agreements to cover for each other in case things happen. Sure. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and open it um, up for... Uh, I'm sorry, you guys push your button. They work. They're pushing it. They're <laughs> pushing it. I'm sorry. Commissioner Bentley. Well, I, ap I apologize for that. Two, two things... Um, road permits for parades and things like that have to go through F, F dot. Um, Depends on the road. Yeah, yeah. That's, on, that's, that's, that's on the road. road, just for clear. And the county does not have an area where we will say direct someone, like the firemen, right, if they're looking for an opportunity to, to mm -hmm. do their, their boot. So we're just going to dismiss that. We can't do that. We can't. Well, the firemen, the, whether it's the firemen or any other member of the public, they can remain on sidewalks. Um, they can't be on the median, um, but they can be on a sidewalk, and they cannot enter the traveled portion of the road to receive a donation. But if people are inclined to turn into um, a shopping center or get, you know, lawfully park their car, um, those types of activities would still be accommodated under the ordinance. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right. I'm going to go ahead and go to public comment. Open public comment on um, proposed uh, ordinance number 19-41. Yeah, this thing sticks. Ordinance 19-41. Anyone who would like to make a comment? Okay, seeing no one come forward, I'm going to close public comment. We have a motion by Commissioner Serbia, seconded by Commissioner Whitmore. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. <laughs> Chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you, Kate. Good Thank job. You. Good work. Great job. That was uh, a big one. First up. All right. Uh, <laughs> next up is uh, resolution R uh, number item number fifty-seven, adoption of resolution R nineteen one twenty-nine, resolution <laughs> vacating a portion of Roseland Drive and Pine Street within the Rose Park Plat. Um, go ahead and hear from staff. Yes, yeah, staff. Hey. Good morning, County Commissioners, Mr. Palmer, Ms. Corrier. My name is Charles Menner with the Property Acquisition Division. It is a vacation to uh, vacate part of Roseland Drive and Pine Street within the Rose Park plat. Um, there was one thing that came up during the review process, and that was by Public Works. And Public Works requested a permanent drainage easement. So permanent drainage easement is part of this approval process. And the property management department recommends approval as well. Okay, thank you. Um, to hear from the applicant, I guess. Do you have any? Well, the applicant's attorney notified me on Friday. He's in Italy, oh. so they uh, they did have an applicant's attorney. Okay. But, oh. All right. This uh, uh, gentleman I'm not familiar with. I'm sorry. We know him. Well, we do, but we're <laughs> wondering why uh, he's here. Yes, I represent the applicant, Marco oh. Manati. Uh, I've not been sworn, but I'm here. Uh, representing the applicant. This is, no, no, this is legislative. No need to be sworn. All right. Just yeah. state your name for the record. And uh, Jeffrey Johnson. Uh, last I'm name. sorry. What was that last name? Last name. Yeah. <laughs> Spelled J-O-N-S-S-O-N. -S -S <laughs> and uh, yeah, here representing Marco Manatee. Um, and doesn't seem to be any opposition to it. It's just a simple vacating of the property. Um, and we don't really have much of a dog in the fight, no pun intended. Um, yeah. So <laughs> we're happy to, you know, let it go. That is the okay. Sad. All right. Um, <laughs> anyone else who'd like to uh, address the board on this application? 
for vacation. Okay, seeing no one come forward, I'm going to close public comment. Commissioner Trace. Uh, yeah, I was going to mention the drainage easement because there is some, you know, stuff. But would we have the easement on it? I know that'll be taken care of. I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve the recommended motion. Second. All right, we have a motion for approval and a second. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Chair votes so aye. I have to open up for public comment first. I, I did, didn't I? Didn't I open up for public I thought comment? You did. Did I? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Somebody confirm. Yeah. They're okay. saying no. no. I don't think so. <coughs> All right. I'm sorry. So. I'm going to open this um, vacation application up for public comment. Is there anyone who'd like to make a comment regarding the application? Seeing no one forward. It comes Madam forward. Chair, for clarification, the the, uh, the motioning commissioner is is moving to adopt both components of the motion. Correct. The resolution yes, and the I acceptance am. of the permanent drainage easement. Yes, I am. Thank you. And the seconder agrees? Yes. Okay. We've had public comment. I've closed public comment. We have a motion by Commissioner Trace to adopt the resolution R19129 and accept the permanent drainage easement from Marco of Manatee, Inc. in St. Nick's LLC. And we have a second. So all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Tell your dad we hope he's yeah. feeling better. Um, his lunch. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, okay. Any questions about the dashboard? Anybody? Anybody look at it? Any questions? They're going to correct them. <laughs> okay. We're correct. still having some issues um, with access for all the reports, and um, regretfully, I did not address that from our last meeting. So I will do that going forward. Make sure you get that in a written form. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it is. It is just a little bit harder to read than the. Well, it's the just the police report. The other report's okay. not attached. Just okay. You know. Yes. Okay. The public safety. Right. That's all there report is. That, okay. the public safety. Yeah, I guess I. It's just kind of fond of the old one. Um, all right. Moving on to item number sixty, the thirty-fourth annual report of the county attorney's office. Dun, 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 dun. Drum roll, <laughs> please. Dun, dun, He's done. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was repeatedly <laughs> warned in briefings yesterday to keep this brief, so. I appreciate others had the same <laughs> thought that I did. How many, how many did? So, <laughs> oh, there you go. So I, I will keep too, it right? brief. Uh, each of you received a hard copy yesterday along with uh, the administrator, and the clerk has also received a hard copy today for the county's permanent records. Uh, again, I'll be very brief, uh, just a couple of stats. Uh, my office uh, received 411 requests for legal services in the most recent fiscal year, and we answered 413 RLSs. Those numbers don't match because some RLSs arrive uh, uh, before the fiscal year and some arrive later. Not a mathematician. Um, <laughs> the attorneys in the office recorded uh, almost 17,000 uh, billable hours last week, um, and or excuse me, last week, last year. And... Um, so when we, uh, when, when we extrapolate that out uh, to a very, very conservative hourly rate for lawyers and for paralegals uh, and then compare that with uh, our uh, annual budget for the county attorney's office, uh, we saved you uh, a little over $2.8 million in attorney's fees last year had you been, uh, had you, had you, uh, been utilizing uh, private lawyers for your legal services. Uh, once again, I'm proud to state uh, that uh, my office's overall budget on the legal side of the house, not the risk management side of the house, but on the legal side of the house uh, for fiscal year 2020 uh, will be $2.854 million, which is less than one-half of 1%. 1 again, less than one-half of 1% 1 of the overall 2020 county budget. So we would like to think that we continue to provide you with uh, an excellent bargain for the money. Um, on page 24 is an outline of the one, two, three, four, five, five instances in the course of the last year where I exercised my settlement authority uh, without board involvement, um, uh, the, the largest individual settlement as among those five was for $13,500 in a personal injury claim. So again, that's on page 24, and that's, that's pursuant to uh, the county attorney ordinance that requires me to report to you once annually on those instances where I exercise my settlement authority 
and claims against uh, the county. Uh, risk management was very busy again this year um, in terms of general liability, auto liability, property, and other, uh, other types of claims. They opened 215 claims in the most recent fiscal year, and they closed 235 claims in the most recent fiscal year. In terms of workers' compensation claims, uh, we opened 398 new claims in the most recent fiscal year and closed 440 claims. Uh, so those are just some statistics for you. Finally, on page 76 uh, is your bio section. Nice photographs of uh, all of my staff along with brief bios. We do have some new people, some new faces that, uh, that I want to briefly mention. Um, Nicole Ferris uh, on page 84. Uh, of the booklet is our newest uh, workers' comp claims adjuster, and uh, we're very pleased to have Nicole on board. She replaces the retiring Joanne Gallo. And uh, our newest attorney, whom most of you have met at this point, uh, is Doug Polk, uh, a very seasoned and well-respected personal injury litigator. He's been at it for 30 years, and his bio was on page 78 of uh, your, uh, your booklet, and so Doug is our newest attorney. Uh, so some new faces. Uh, so I will I will leave it at that. Um, I would ask the board to um, uh, to take the action that's called for in item number 60, which is uh, approval and acceptance into the record of the 34th annual report of the county attorney's office. <clears throat> and, and, and also, uh, before you make your motion, I, yeah, I urge you all to study this whenever you've got a few extra moments. And uh, you know, and, and, and question me privately uh, or publicly, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, about any, any questions you might have after you've looked at any, any portions of the report. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's here for you to review at any time at your leisure. Okay. okay. So move that we accept. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, questions for the county attorney or comments? Commissioner Servia? I just want to acknowledge the level of professionalism of the attorneys in your office, Mickey. Um, I enjoy working with them very much, and they do a wonderful job. Thank you, Commissioner Servia. I, you know, I, I, I've said a number of times over the years that it, it seems like I spent the first three or four years as county attorney reviewing resumes and conducting interviews. Uh, but I, I, I cannot be more proud of the team that I've put together that's in place as of today. And, and uh, I, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm just gushing with pride, and, and I appreciate the, the nice comments. Commissioner Whitmore. And I agree with um, Misty's comments. Uh, just breezing through the bios of uh, all the your attorneys, I was surprised Anne um, was an assistant public defender for Hillsborough County, and then she worked in the private sector as a defense attorney. So the, every, usually you see state's attorneys come into ours. So, and I can tell by the way she is, now it makes more sense, you know, she's uh, with her personality. The only thing I would ask, I think I asked it last time too, we have a lot of um, paralegals or legal assistants, and I know they're assigned to certain attorneys. Mm -hmm. I would love to be able to know kind of who they're assigned to. So Good. instead of, because a lot of times I don't need to speak to the attorney. And they're working, you know, and I was just wondering in the future or on these, if somebody could just send us a list so I can write their name and who they're working for. I'll be happy, I'll be happy to, uh, to provide you with that list. And, of course, the department does a wonderful job. And hopefully with these new changes with the state that you'll be able to complement your staff. Uh, because We have a plan. Good. We have a plan that's in, yeah. Good, uh, great. It's in the works. And, uh, yeah. So yeah, Anne's got an interesting background, doesn't she? Yeah, I think she w I uh, breezed through it. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think she was the only one that worked in public as a public defender. I think that's true. And then in also in private sector too, which even was more surprising. So, but congratulations to everybody. They do a great job. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Mickey, does um, is this report available to the public? I know it wasn't online. So, is it, how would the if the public wanted to review this, is it available to the public? If the public wanted to look at it, I would suggest to simply uh, communicate with my office. Just call my office, 745-3750, 745-3750, uh, and ask for a copy of it, and we'll gladly provide it. Because um, I, I think sometimes the public doesn't know the breadth of everything that we right. do. Right. Um, oh. And if there's nothing, you know, that is of sensitive information in here, then they might want to no, take a no, look at it. No, it's clearly a public record, no doubt. And I, and I, again, I sound like a broken record in this respect too, but your typical private practice lawyer has no conception 
of the breadth of subject matters that we deal with in a local government office. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> it really is. And I, and I echo everyone who has said, I mean, we, we've got some really sharp attorneys that we work with. I really appreciate their ability to tackle a lot of these issues um, in, a, in a bigger way than just looking, you know, very um, individually at what's coming before us. They're thinking about how it might affect us, what, how it might affect the community. And that's really, you know, that's important. It's, we're, not, we're not lawyers up here. We come from different backgrounds. So we need to have some uh, folks that think about that. I, you know, I know that they're working so hard on this pet issue. Um, it's been amazing, and uh, we're going to have obviously a big Halloween discussion on that. But I, Halloween I do want to say before we get there that I think they've done an incredible yeah. job of again trying to research us, trying to get us the information we need to make good decisions. And I appreciate that. You're certainly welcome. Okay. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve and accept the uh, 34th Annual Report of the County Attorney's Office. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, uh, nay. Chair votes aye, motion passes. Technically, you might want to ask for public comment. I'm sorry, did anyone <laughs> want to comment on the County Attorney's? Okay, see no one on close Thank public you. comment. All right, we approve that. Okay, so we can't go to 11 o'clock to the Port Authority. Um, can't go to items pulled from consent. So we'll go ahead and go to Commissioner Comments. 61. 61. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, that's the problem when I think Florida I'm done Florida Department and I'm of not. Transportation update. Uh, Florida Department of Transportation. Sorry. Been not. waiting all day. Update on Barrier Island Traffic Study. Um, good morning, for the record, Clark Davis, Deputy Director of Busy. Public Works Clark Traffic Davis Management. Uh, this comes to you as one of several different plans that the state and uh, MPO are working on this year as they work on their long-range transportation plan. The, the long-range transportation plan you can think of as the, as its name implies, a, a long-range look at the different transportation improvements that are needed to serve our area. And around it are these satellite plans, a congestion management plan. You've probably heard about the active transportation plan that they're updating now. The things, one-off studies like the congestion, uh, or sorry, the Central Manatee Network Alternatives Analysis, and more recently, the Barrier Island Traffic Study. What will happen is the FDOT will be presenting this to the MPO board at their November meeting. That happens one day before your next meeting. So we're trying to present this to you today as a group, uh, knowing that the those of you that sit on the MPO board will see it uh, before you have a chance to reconvene as the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, Nathan Couts from uh, FDOT is here to walk you through a short presentation, and it will conclude with a list of projects that are going to be included in it. Um, when the MPO board takes action on it, it will not be, say, to adopt these as project priorities, but to recognize that study as a source of projects, and which in turn would be advanced by the local uh, jurisdictions that are members of the um, of the MPO. I will hand that out now. I've got about 12 copies. I should get around the dais. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Um, so I have um, seen a theme that brevity is a virtue this morning. Um, I'll try to keep it brief and then open for questions if you have any. State your name for the record, please. My name is Nathan Kaltz. I'm the district traffic safety engineer. Um, I was the district services engineer when this started. Uh, myself and Bessie Reyna, who is our planning uh, services manager in our planning studios department, have been managing this study. So for those of you that aren't familiar, um, essentially the barrier islands get very busy, uh, even when it's not season. Um, it's, uh, to put it a little more colloquially, it's kind of like trying to stuff 10 pounds of potatoes in a five pound sack. Mm -hmm. So the MPO brought to FDOT the problem statement and a desire to do a study to see if there was anything to alleviate that problem. You know, we're looking at the amount of roadways, the limited uh, options other than a personal vehicle, um, parking options. So our goal was to make more short-term operational improv improvements with a mind towards long-term sustainable improvements that could handle some of this congestion. One of the things I'd like to present uh, through our data, uh, we got a, we contracted with a company called Streetlight that you essentially uses cell phone data to determine where people were coming from. It looks at uh, largely where your phone was at night and where it is during the day. Mm -hmm. um, 
<clears throat> a lot of our visitor, visitors are what I would consider locals. Um, if you look, the vast majority, Tampa St. Pete to the north side, Punta Gorda to the south, Polk County um, to the east side, these are folks that can probably make a trip to the, to the beach and back in half a day and still enjoy themselves. You know, they're going to be regulars. And this is important because when we talk about solutions, we don't have to necessarily train out of country or out of state folks. These are people that are going to come regularly that can get an idea for what sort of amenities or programs you may have. Um, we've got over 60 recommendations. My last count was 77. Um, it's, it's a very wide breadth of recommendations from parking solutions, wayfinding, which would just, you know, could be as simple as a sign saying the bridge is up, take this alternate route, um, all the way up to my personal favorite, number five on the list, which is a vehicle-free island. Um, we see that some other islands in the country, Fire Island, New York, Mackinac Island, Michigan. Um, and there's an opportunity for some partnerships, public-private partnerships, partnerships with transit agencies. Commissioner Daly had an excellent suggestion when we first started in our steering committees to form a technical working group. So we have um, technical staff could vet solutions without, um, to, to kind of look at, at the solutions objectively. Uh, not everybody was always in agreement, but we try to take as, uh, as much input as we could to make sure we have a good plan. Well, we ended up um, with some objective criteria, essentially looking at um, time savings, uh, reduction in vehicle miles, miles traveled, and the amount of people that it served. So if you really break it down to what's simple, we're looking at how many people does the solution affect, how much time does that save them, and can we cut down on the amount that they have to drive or get around the island to do what they need to do and enjoy the community. This was weighted and put into a cost benefit. Um, the costs are looking at the basic cap capital cost initially and the operational costs in the future. <clears throat> Our successes to date, already there's a few of the items being implemented. Um, many of you are probably familiar with, for example, Cortez and 119th, the intersection there. There's some other safety improvements in Cortez. Uh, MCAT as a service development grant. They are going to be piloting a, a park and ride service to the beaches um, later this year. Uh, one note on that, it would be a lot more effective with a flexible third lane on the bridges, which we su suggest. So I would take it as a pilot to see feasibility, but it is also more potential in the future to be even more impactful. Um, Anna Maria Island has, or Bradenton, I believe, has gotten a grant to look at dredging and a water taxi. Uh, Stair 64 sidewalk at Neal Preserve, Hawk Signals, smart parking technology in St. Armand Circle. There's a number of successes we've already had to date um, to start reducing this congestion. Done? As <laughs> pretty much, as, as Clark said, we're, we're going to be presenting to uh, the Manatee MPO we wanted to get with y'all. Um, one thing I would like to leave you with is we started off this this study thinking about reducing or um, making it easier for vehicles. But when we come down to it, there's a limited amount of right of way. There's not a lot of space. And since this is a national treasure and more people are going to come, especially as they move into Manatee County and the surrounding areas, we started trying to shift to thinking about moving people. Um, moving people is a lot. <clears throat> we can get a lot more people on the island than we can vehicles. And sometimes we can increase the experience. Um, at this time, do you have any questions about it? Well, I'm sure there's going to be some questions and comments. Commissioner Whitmore. Mainly comments. Um, I've lived on the island for 51 years. And there's no way you're going to get, you're, like you said, I mean, it's constrained. Mm -hmm. the, I, the city leaders years ago affirmed that they realized it was going to be constrained because we weren't going to um, widen the roads. So we all know that, and, and we live with it. Um, you know, when I first started here, we'd go to Washington, D.C., and our, and then we also would even go to our, well, mainly it was Washington, D.C. We'd go there and we'd say we're from Manatee County, and they'd go, well, where is that? And we'd have to say, well, have you ever heard of Lombo Key or Sarasota? And they say yes. Well, I've just heard, recently heard it, and it, I think it's confirmed. I, as you all know, I live like on 85th Street in Holmes Beach, but right across from me is White Avenue, and there's a, a railroad company that owns the, the lay-by, it's called. Well, it was just posted, and I've talked to three different sources, and I, um, and including the realtor, but it was just sold for $8.5 million to Garth Brooks. Cool. 
Cindy Lopper was at the Waterfront restaurant a couple months ago. Um, as we know, Michael Kaur lives in the north end of Lombok Key. That's his vacation place. And Cameron Diaz has been coming there since she was two years old. My daughter's met her a few times at the beach. So the island's not going to get any less congested. I know the state, I, and I never could understand why the, the, the islands wanted to do this study. What are we going to do? The only thing oh, we could do yeah. to inc increase capacity would be to widen, and all of the cities have put in their comp plans that they don't want to do that. So I appreciate you doing this. The, um, <laughs> the trolleys and all that have helped. I actually started the trolley on the island, and it does carry about 500,000 people a day that maybe 100,000 would have I mean, a year, that would have a car. So that's a good thing. Paid parking, I can tell you right now, all three cities have adamantly opposed it so far, because um, I saw that you mentioned that in St. Armand's. And um, I, I hear all of a sudden that when you do build the Cortez Bridge, that you're actually thinking about doing a uh, turn um, roundabout, 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 which we've been asking for for 20 years, and all of a sudden now it's coming that we're getting the bridge. So that was mentioned. It was written in the newspaper. Um, and um, that's a good thing, because we should have done that years ago, because the issue is with Lombok Key and the, the traffic south to us coming up to go to Cortez Road. So I appreciate this. Um, I know you probably are going to be presenting to this to the other cities. I heard, if, and have you presented this to Lombok Key? They were at the recent steering committee. So um, everything that we've presented to you today, uh, Jack Daly, Tom Harmer, Isaac Rahman, they, sh they should all have the information. And have you had any input from them? Yes. Yes. Because I know they were th the big thing was the Cortez of the 119th, and I know we're still working on that. And actually, just the little bit that you did do well, with moving the light more to the west, not moving the light, but actually the uh, the where you park, I mean, it's it's much better flowing now, and also going east out of the development, what you did there, that's been working great. I haven't had one complaint about it since then. So I actually asked Sherry yesterday, are we still doing the road on 119th? Because I haven't had a complaint since you guys reworked that. So I don't know if you've had that. So um, just, just a few comments. Uh, for somebody that actually lives there, you know, I, I have no problems. I am very ever barely late, ever, for a meeting. And I live there, and I go there two or three times a day, off and on, the island, and I just know how to work with it with the tourism. So when you're coming out there to um, have the island experience, you have to take a chill pill. They're starting to put um, signs out. The city of Holmes Beach, they have a message board that has little catchy phrases, and um, you know, like they said, you're on island time, slow down, and make sure you're wearing your seatbelt, stuff like that, I've been noticing lately. So I, I know that we're doing some things, but um, you know I, I just had to bring those observations that in order to keep the character, whatever's left of the islands, of uh, why people come from all over the world now and know us, we have to be careful on some of the decisions we make up here. Well, um, I sit on the MPO, and I can tell you that this study was uh, fought for yeah. very hard by the island communities, okay. specifically. Yep. Jack Daly, they've been so involved. I spoke to him yesterday about this. Um, the, uh, you know, um, John Chappie, that people have been working very, very hard. You're, the committees that you've worked with, I want to say thank you to DOT. There are 76 proposed ideas on here, and they aren't widening the road. <laughs> oh, I know they're There's not. There's 76, and I, you can maybe help. that When this study came about, I know that there was a consultant hired, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you're not with a consultant. You no, are with DOT. The consultant had the charge to look at our season as if it was an, an event mm -hmm. because you do things when you have events to control traffic, right? We know if you're going to have a national convention in Tampa, you have an event. You have to do things. And I think that strategy... <coughs> is very helpful when we think about the beach. And I, like I said, I, you know, we, we're going to talk about, because I'm going to bring it up, about intergovernmental coordination with places like Longboat Key mm -hmm. and the island. And this study has been so important to bring those partners together. Have you been involved in it since kind of the beginning? Mostly. We've been through a few project managers. Um, I came in right at the end of phase one. So phase one, if you remember, was the literature review right. of the existing studies. Phase two is operational. Phase three is more planning level. Yeah. 
Well, I, I just, I heard what Carol said, and I, I just, I want to make sure that we don't in any way think that this is just another study that has, going to have no application for solving the problem, and yeah, we know the beach, the beaches are extremely important, but honestly, just hearing you say that the third lane on the bridge, this board asked for that. And we were told by DOT that that was not a possibility. Yeah, so right. I now hear DOT say that might make some sense. So we are making huge progress, in my they opinion. They can lower the height then. Um, uh, yeah, well, uh, we're going to go there. Yeah, I know. I mean, the fact of the matter is that... Um, <laughs> Dale laughing. <laughs> I'm trying, Dale. I'm trying. I mean, I, I, that makes so much sense. You know, and I was thinking about it last night. You know, it doesn't matter if we have a beach shuttle. If the beach shuttle is just stuck in traffic, you're going to have to have a dedicated lane. And we were told that it could be striped to have have that dedicated line but um, you know I I'm I'm thrilled by this I will tell you I will study these options before it gets to the MPO mm -hmm. so I can ask questions but um, you know, I I think that this has been something that it has been very good for our island communities and the county has participated in this as well to look at alternatives and see what can be done um, so I would urge all of you to look in this keep an open mind and, and yeah, some of them are going to take funding, but look at how fast they did respond at 119th. And, you know, that was Works. good. And DOT has been very responsive, so I appreciate that. Um, I would urge you to talk with your counterparts on the island and ask them for their opinion on this because um, they're not here today. I, I talked to Jack Daly yesterday. He knew we were bringing I told him we had this on. So, um, you know, he's concerned about his, his concern that he brought up to me was the intersection of Gulf Drive and Cortez, right. you know, saying that there can't be anything done there. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know, given, you know, repetitive loss situations that might have occurred out there. I, we, I just did discuss that with him a little bit, whether or not there are alternatives there. But I haven't read your whole list, but I will do that. Other commissioners, Commissioner Baugh. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to, to FDOT. Um, you know, I sit on the MPO as well as uh, Betsy and Misty Servia, and I know that you guys have really gone over and above trying to um, look into this and make some good and tough decisions on what needs to be done or shouldn't be done. Thank you on the third lane. That's wonderful. Um, and I just, you know, for me, of course, where I'm, located, it doesn't affect my district, but it certainly affects Manatee County as a whole. And, um, you know, I, I know that every time we talk about a bridge, you know, you guys go through a really hard time. And it, it, to me, it's kind of amazing because we all sit back and we know that these bridges, we need to do something to them. It, it's time. It, it, we're running out of time. <laughs> So for you guys to move so quickly in trying to come up with solutions, just want you to know that this commissioner really does appreciate it. Um, I actually had a conversation with LK not long ago about it. And, um, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, um, I'm kind of like others up here. I, I don't want to see the charm of Manatee changed, but at the same time, I also know that you have to adjust to the future in some way. So um, thank you for taking uh, the Cartesians into, um, you know, your thoughts in, in working with this, FDOT working with this situation. And um, I look forward to uh, the next step. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Whitmore? Uh, let me get some things straight. I am, it's nothing against you. I've been involved. I, I remember um, when the FDOT was, um, was ta tasked to do this, and Lombok Key was a big vocal, like Betsy said. And because of the traffic and getting through Bradenton Beach to get on Cortez Road. The charm, I mean, guys, you know, Cortesians, working with Cortesians. I talked to the main people in Cortez yesterday. Unfortunately, Mary Green kept me on the phone for about an hour, and I was sitting in the parking lot at the fair trying to get out. They are not happy about this 65 foot. I may, I may, you may all think they have, and unfortunately, my representatives on the MPO have chosen not to say anything about it. I heard Chappie said something at the last MPO meeting, and we're out, it's out of our hands. And you know, it was out of our hands about the diverging diamond, but we sure um, went to Tallahassee and fought for it because we had an issue. This is nothing with you, uh, an issue 
that we got it done and it wasn't even supposed to be started till 2023. So don't say we can't do anything. And if you all think Cortez is happy about it, one of um, somebody that you all know, he spoke to me, he goes, you know, that bridge is gonna be built and then they're all gonna just go away and forget about us. I mean, you know, and that's what's gonna happen. So I may be the lone voice up here, but you guys are on the MPO and, and you represent us too in the islands. And every city in the island has signed in resolution, sent it to the state that they don't support the 65 foot. I know you guys may be wanting to make the tough decisions. Are we done? Okay. I know you all want to make tough decisions, but I'm telling you, I respect you guys for your districts. I know I'm an at-large commissioner, but I'm a 51 year resident out there. And I would expect a little bit respect for the time that I've been there. And I've been a leader in that community also as an elected official. So charm, yes. Cortez, if you think Cortez supports this, then you guys haven't been down to Cortez and talked to anybody like I have. And I task, I task that with my district commissioner too. You know, I have talked to these people and they haven't been talked to to him. So they're trying to work with FDOT because if it does come, they know they have to deal with this. But they don't want the 65. They want the 45, which the state, eh, they took it out of the plan. So we only, only consider 35 or 65. You know, shame on them. And I'm sorry, even though it started moving forward, it's still going to be changing. You all know that. Just, just use the diversion diamond. Just use that. And I will stick by that. So, you know, I take this personally and I um, don't appreciate it being brushed off when things like parking and all that, and you guys don't drive there every day. You don't know what we're all going through. People like Garth Brooks come there because of that. Yeah, let's change it and look like Sarasota that he didn't choose to live in. So, sorry, I don't usually get on my soapbox, so I apologize. That's all. Well, um, yeah, this is not about the bridge, but I'll, I'll be totally clear. And I, if you don't think I'm totally clear, then please, please ask me a question. I went to the meetings. I have reviewed the input that was taken over many, many, many public meetings that were held regarding the bridge. It is not true that everyone on the island wanted no bridge, the, the lower bridge. That's simply not true. Many people on the islands, and it is facts, you can see the factual information that DOT has voted for the high span bridge. There were votes taken, or not really votes, they filled out forms and said so. And if you look at the data that was gathered, yes, there are undoubtedly people, and I've heard the concerns about Cortez. I have talked to LK about the concerns in Cortez. LK has told me that he will be meeting with people. In there November. is no intent to destroy any businesses in Cortez by building this bridge. <coughs> And quite frankly, it's irresponsible to say that that would be anyone's intent up here on the board to in any way destroy <coughs> what is happening in Cortez. Will there be a change? Absolutely. I watched what happened with the Ringling Bridge in Sarasota. People went to court and fought it, fought it tooth and nail, wasted so much funding, so much money, so much time. I've seen what happened when the bridge was turned down the last time. I get it that people don't want change. They're concerned about how it's going to affect their life, especially people that have been lived on the island for 51 years. I have no doubt that you're concerned about change and how it will affect, you know, the, all of Manatee County. And to Commissioner Baugh, what the heck? You're, I know, I go to the beach. I would bet a lot of people in Lakewood Ranch go to the beach. Yeah. So yes, it does affect people in Lakewood Ranch, no doubt. But we're dealing with so many issues. It isn't simplistic. We can't just say, you know, that we don't need a higher bridge. If you look at the statistics why that bridge was chosen, the statistics say that you allow so many more boats th that go through it. That's what the report said. So I would encourage everyone to read the report, not just react emotionally. And yeah, DOT has, has promised to me that they're going to be meeting with people in Cortez, not saying that they're going to solve all their issues, but I think that's what we fight for, is for people to have an opportunity to get the real information and not just react. And emotionally. just to be clear, I'm on the board still. Um, I, the islands are not against Manatee Avenue Bridge, just so you know, Betsy. We've all voted for it. I voted for it as a city commissioner. That's how long ago this has been going on, and that's a long time. 
they're not, they're totally supportive of Manatee Avenue Bridge because the state owns the right of way both sides. There's no imminent domain. There's no issues to any infrastructure. So we've been supportive of that many years ago. What they are so, um, not supportive of, of the intimate domain that's going to be taking, taking away the character of Cortez. This is a different thing. I, it's not change. I know the bridge is coming. I voted for it. Me and Miss Duffy are the ones that were the tie votes to allow the high bridge years ago. So I, uh, you can't say I'm against change. I'm against where this bridge is located and, and the properties you're going to affect. But I'm, I'll deal with it. Commissioner Bob and everybody else. Yes, I, I just want to add, uh, Commissioner Badak, thank you for your comments. They're right on target. Um, it is nothing personal for me uh, with this. And yes, some people do go to the beach from Lakewood Ranch, but you know, Lakewood Ranch isn't just my district. It's a much larger area than just Lakewood Ranch. But I will say that um, as far as the DDI, uh, I'm the one that took care of that. I'm the one that went to Tallahassee and fought for that and got it done. Uh, this board had it on the agenda for 2035. So, you know, to have that thrown at me, uh, Commissioner uh, Whitmore, I, I am not taking anything personal here. Um, you know, but I do want to make sure that the facts are the facts, and that is simply not the facts, what you said about the DDI. For me, I am concerned about uh, Manatee County and, and keeping our history. In fact, I think we've lost a lot of history over the years that we should have kept. So, um, you know, to, to tell this board that you're taking this personally because maybe we're not coming out and, and agreeing with you, please, uh, it has nothing to do. I don't think this board has taken a side one way or the other. Okay. Uh, neither has the MPO. Um, and when it does come forward to the MPO, we will all make sure that we're thoroughly knowledge, you know, we have as much knowledge as possible if it comes to the uh, MPO for us to vote. So, um, you know, I, I don't like the thought that you're taking this personally. It is not a personal issue, uh, in my opinion. So I apologize if that's how you're taking it, but that's not the concern, I don't think, for any of us up here. We just want it taken care of. We want a bridge replaced. You know, we keep talking about we need bridges replaced, and then we complain about everything that FDOT comes forward with. We've got to start getting these bridges replaced. So, um, I, you know, that's just the way it is at this point. Thank you. And I just want to say, because I said it kind of incorrectly, I mean, there's been a lot of governments working on this, including Sarasota County. I don't think I called them out. I mean, they're obviously issues of choke points at St. Armand's have been addressed. You know, um, Longboat Key sits in a very unique position because they don't have any direct assets. So they have to go right. either through Longboat Key to get on the Ringling Bridge or come north to our two bridges say that they have one we have two right two bridges to be able to leave the island so um i i do think sarasota county long Key, everyone has been working really good on this study so i don't want to lose i know we're kind of diverting into the whole bridge discussion and of course you just have to stand there and smile but um because it's not your issue i know that for dot but um that this is this particular study has been a very good example of intergovernmental coordination. I don't know what the end results will be, but I appreciate you just updating us. Commissioner Whitmore, and then we're going to. Yeah, and, and again, it's nothing personal against uh, Commissioner Mo. I didn't mean it like that. What I meant is, you know, it seems like when, you know, district commissioners need our support. You know, and I usually support the district commissioner and, you know, even though, I mean, this is mine, but I actually live there. So, but the DDI was also brought up because of Benderson and um, because of the rowing championships. And we all were trying to coordinate that together. So we all went up to Tallahassee and Vanessa went up with, don't get all pushing your buttons. Let me finish. Vanessa uh, went up with um, Sarasota County, had a terrible plane ride. In fact, they all drove back. It was so bad. But we got things done. We got it all done together with both counties together. And what I'm just saying is I just feel like I'm the lone wolf here because um, I know we it hasn't come before the MPO, but I guess John Chappie brought it up, and I guess uh, nobody made a comment from what I heard. So, and that's what I mean. There's no response from anybody else because, you know, things can still be done on, within the next year or two. Yeah, the FDOT may be spending a little bit of extra money if we have to change it. I'm just telling you how the people down there feel about it, so. 
you know, and I have a right to do that. But we all worked hard on that DDI because of the world rowing, and that's why the governor moved it up, and we all know that. And it was in Vanessa's district, and she was the district commissioner, and she worked on it very hard. But we all went up in force to do that. So I just wanted to make that clear. And I was just wishing I could get that force with the Cortez Bridge, but I'm not going to. And again, it's nothing against you. You're just having to stand there. Sorry. Yeah, and, and uh, I'll just, I just hope we could close this off so that we can move on. I know we've got just a few more things to do on our agenda before we can take off. But um, yeah, Commissioner Whitmore, I, you're, you're a passionate advocate for the folks on the island who have, rep have come before you and asked you to do this. But we all have a job to do too. And I, I you know, the access to the barrier islands affects everyone in the county, everyone. Because we do. We live here to go to the beach, a lot of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. You go um, more than I do. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, that's why I ride my bike as much as I can. <laughs> but the, um, the reality is that there has not been any action by this board to change what is the recommendation. Right. And you right. have brought it up consistently. Mm -hmm. John Chappie has brought it up. I do not recall seeing letters from every island community, but perhaps they have been delivered. But we have not been asked to vote on it at the MPO, even though John Chappie brought it up. And we've not had a motion pass, even though you brought it up here. So that's the way this okay. government works. And I respect I, 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 I think it's interesting, your comparison to the DDI, because we were all dead set in favor of that. Totally. Vanessa eventually took, Vanessa took the lead. Well, yeah. no, no, it was it was one. we never thought we could get the money. It wasn't because we wanted it in 2035. Yeah. We didn't think it could actually happen. But once it was clear that with support from Sarasota and Manatee County, we could make this happen. Everyone here was pushing for that to happen. Vanessa brought that forward. Yeah, I she want was to address face, that when you're but done. We were place. all pushing it as, as there wasn't a single person that was against moving that DDI forward in Manatee County. There was some opposition in Sarasota, but if there was oppos opposition in Manatee County, I am not aware of it. Commissioner Bob. Yeah, I want to address that because I, I think the residents need to make sure that they understand what took place. Um, I started lobbying the Sarasota County Commission before the Manatee Commission because the Manatee Commission had it on the plan for 2035. So I started working with the Sarasota County Commissioners ahead of time. Yes. So at that point, when I got them on board, I brought it back here to this board. Greg Stubbe, who was a, a representative at the time, mm -hmm. scheduled the meeting with FDOT, with the uh, secretary of FDOT. Manatee County and Sarasota both went up on that trip mm -hmm. to the meeting. Uh, I can tell you the secretary looked at me and he said, Commissioner, do you think we need another study? I said, no, sir, you've had three. Mm -hmm. How many more do we need? It's just being put off. At that point in time, it was agreed that the DDI was going to move forward, and they were trying to find funding to fund it. For my birthday, if you all will recall, we were told to go and asked to go to show up to a meeting with the uh, chamber and um, it was announced mm -hmm. that that morning the governor had signed the funding. Uh, it was a done deal. It was going to be funded and built. So I'm not sure how all of the rest of this is coming up other than when I brought all this information to this board, yes, everybody was excited. But it wasn't. Uh, it really, to be honest, a lot of it, was because of Greg Stubbe, uh, who was a House member at that time. So I just don't want the DDI being brought up, because it's not the same as this bridge at all. Um, and Commissioner Whitmore, you're more than welcome to go to Tallahassee and, and uh, you know, lobby and, and do the things that I did to, to get the DDI moving forward. It, you're more than welcome to do that. I, I, I wouldn't have a problem with it. Um, but, you know, to compare it to the DDI is truly not fair. Thank you. Mr. Trace. I'd like to say great presentation. Yeah, yes. thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the <laughs> history of the bridge. It. 
and the DDI, but I would love to see what D Dave Stanford has to say. Right. Okay. Oh, we're at the port. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your presentation. <laughs> against I encourage you. everyone to read this, and I look forward to your presentation at the MPO. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and um, take a recess in <laughs> our board meeting, and we're going to con Thank convene you. the Port Authority. We're going to go right away. So oh. that over I thought we were going to take a little short oh. recess. And Madam Chairman. All right. There's only one thing on the agenda. Let's go. The clerk right. needs a few minutes. The clerk There's only one thing on the agenda. Yeah, but the clerk has to switch Port over. Authority. It just Port a Authority. A minute. Wait, minute. she said give her one minute. All right, we're going to take a... we can a get to the right minutes. Thank okay. you. Good. It's open. Oh, awesome. I tell you, all that did not go missed some great barbecue last night. We're good. Good chat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Before you move on, can you tell me was item 34? Chairman, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Everything is approved but 13. Okay, thank you. So far. You don't need a haircut? <laughs> I need to shave. <laughs> you need to shave. <laughs> Madam Clerk, let me know when you're ready. We're ready. Go. Okay. Go. We'll go ahead and open the Manatee County Port Authority uh, meeting of October the 22nd. Uh, Dave, how are you doing this morning? Uh, fine. Good morning. Uh, Dave Sanford, Deputy Executive Director of uh, Port Manatee. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, we have a very uh, brief but important uh, couple of items for your consideration this morning. Uh, first item up is the uh, consent agenda. Okay. And, Dave, uh, before we get to the consent agenda, is there anyone from the public that would like to come forward and speak? Not seeing anyone. We will close public comment. Okay, Dave, go ahead. We have the consent agenda for your consideration. I move we accept the consent agenda. Second. Second. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Trace, second by Commissioner Servia. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Moving right along. All right, Madam Chair, the next item is a memorandum of agreement with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, this is uh, very important uh, to us. It involves the dredging of our birthing areas uh, in 2017. Uh, you approved a, a similar memorandum. And uh, at this time, we're ready to go into our regular uh, cyclical maintenance. Uh, and we have agreed once again to uh, piggyback on with the Corps' uh, low bid contractor. And that saves us considerable <coughs> money, uh, both in the bid and in the uh, elimination of MOB and DMOB costs uh, for the port. So we save somewhere in the neighborhood of about $200,000. Uh, just by taking this action. So I would ask uh, your consideration of approval of the memorandum. Any comments, commissioners? Move approval of um, the agreement for the additional dredging. Second. second. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Benack, second by Commissioner Trace. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Dave, moving right along. I, you know, at this point, and I know you're probably, do you have any executive uh, comments for Carlos? I, I just, I have one. Uh, you know, we have with us today representatives from the uh, Jacksonville District, the Army Corps of Engineers. Oh. Uh, our project manager, uh, Liz Fiocchi, uh, is with us back here. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a happy and sad occasion because Liz has done a fantastic job supporting Port Manatee. However, she's done such a great job, Did she's got a promoted? tremendous promotion uh, to go to the Corps of Engineers uh, South Pacific Division office in San Francisco. Oh, my goodness, oh. Liz. So, uh, congratulations to Liz, fun. and, and we, we hate to lose her, but no. she's done an unbelievable job. And I, I, I mean that, you know, I'm a former uh, Corps senior executive, and I know good work there when I see it. And she has helped us conclude a over a decades long study of the South Channel, uh, got the reimbursement approved, uh, <laughs> got the uh, assumption of maintenance so that the federal government takes over the maintenance uh, of that channel just in a very short period of time. She's a go-getter. Yeah. Liz, you. you're going to be missed. Yes. But congratulations. Congratulations.
Uh, that concludes my uh, remarks. Okay. Um, I, I guess I'll go ahead at this point. And, uh, Dave is aware of this, and Carlos. Um, I don't know that all of you know, but we, we had a great meeting in D.C. Uh, that I was at with Jocelyn and, and Charlie. I think Charlie's here. And um, we've been trying to get reimbursed from, from some dredging that we did back in 2011 to the tune of, I think it's $3.1 million. And five, then five also, 5.1, five point five. you're right. And then um, also Washington Park, um, the fill for there. So it looks like that we might have truly, and I'm not going to go into it 100% yet, but uh, it looks like we had um, a lot of great success with that endeavor, and we should know for sure by, I think, mid-November. So mm -hmm. uh, we're going to keep our fingers crossed on that. But. In fact, okay. I had some very positive feedback from the secretary's office on uh, your oh, phone. Oh, you did? Your phone oh, good. Call. Yeah. Good. That's nice to know because I'm telling you, I, I don't think I've come off a of cloud nine yet with that meeting. <laughs> um, I, I think when it finally gets done, we need to make sure that we send a uh, mm -hmm. special thank you to Congresswoman Napolitano. Yes. On the, oh, Misty yes. was in the meeting too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I'm telling you, she it was amazing to watch her in action. Yeah. I'm not kidding. It was great. All right, Dave, well, thank you. Um, anyone yet from the public want to come forward? No? Okay. Thank you. All right, and thank any commissioner you. comments for the port? No. All right, Dave, thank you guys for being here. Uh, the Port Authority meeting is closed. Okay, well, um, we will reconvene as soon as the clerk tells me we can. <laughs>
Yeah, with everything that's going on about panhandling and homelessness, I'm, I'm learning the importance of us being involved with the, um, the COC, the continuum of care. I've also learned um, that the county, back in 2006, um, had a, um, a, a plan to end homelessness, ten for, for a 10-year plan, mm -hmm. and I would like to revisit that. Um, I, I plan on looking at it over this weekend, to be honest with you, I just received it, so I, I think we need to bring that bike up based on the current discussion. And I do want to commend um, the sheriff. They're looking into their hot team. They've taken some um, mm -hmm. steps as far as to support the homeless outreach approach. So um, those are my comments. Okay, great. Commissioner Trace? I'd just like to say thank you to all the group at the IFAS, which is part county, part state, how much work they do on the farm city. It means a lot to the people in the ag community. And if you haven't taken the tours, I would suggest you do the the amount of volunteers that do this program, it's all along with the <coughs> IFAS people, uh, is uh, tremendous. We're losing a lot of our older people that do the tours, that know the history. Um, I keep telling us we should write it down, but none of us like to write. Um, but uh, uh, we'll say this for y'all lucky ones. My son is going to be a tour guide this year because I think we need to start younger ones, and uh, I've told him only to lie a little. So it should be a pretty good try. A little. <laughs> I mean, just a little. Yeah. We've heard some of his stories. We know he's good at that. Yeah. <laughs> he can tell some stories. Yeah. Comes by an honest. Learned that from his grandfather. His grandfather was pretty his good. Grandfather his grandfather was, And he, you know, family <coughs> motto is don't let the truth stand in the way of a good story. So. <laughs> that was good. It's a family motto. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people do that actually. <laughs> It's the best advertisement you can oh. give for that for that <laughs> tour. Well, my dad was a was a very favorite on the tour, and uh, I've done it several times. And uh, I just think the young folks need to start getting into it. And I'm happy to say that my son is knows the history. He's been around his grandfather, got a lot of the old stories, and uh, it, especially with it being fishing, as much as my family is fish. So I sent him along on the tour this year, which means I have to work because <laughs> you got to work on the farm. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to go ahead and go to our 11.30 time certain, which is item number 13. Um, <coughs> it works, so I can read it in the record. It's the item number 13 was on the consent of the reduction of code enforcement fines for Jeffrey L. Guy case CE 20051203399. Mr. Bowman, would you like to present? Misty. Or, Misty, did you want to ask a question first? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you. I don't think I need a full presentation. Uh, I want to start by saying, Jeff, thank you so much. You do such an awesome job. Thank I you. really, really thank you and your staff for the work that you do. And see, the only reason I pulled this was because I'd like to have a discussion with the board members up here. Um, because I think that we would be well served to have a procedure in place to address these items that have been on the books for so many years. And this is an example that went on for 13 years. Um, and I'd like for us to come up with a way so that they don't drag on this long and the fines don't accrue for this long um, because I, I just don't think it serves anyone well. It's an administrative problem uh, to keep track of it. And then you get to a point where we're in a position where we have to write off all of these charges. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd like to suggest and make a motion that we ask our staff to bring back a procedure for how long we will assess these fines before a lien is placed. Or do we have one, yeah. Jeff? Yeah, I was just going to say before you do that, let me kind of walk you through how we do business today compared okay. to years ago. Um, right now, when we take a case to the magistrate, we put a cap on it. It's $20,000. We have more tools in our toolbox, which I've, re, you know, which I'll reiterate from I think the last time I was before the board. We have injunctive relief, which the county attorney's office, who's been wonderful in working with, uh, has been successful in all the injunctions that we've asked uh, from his office. We also have notices to appear before the county judge, which have proven to be successful. So, our goal is that what you're talking about. We don't want these things to, to drag on for years with no uh, conclusion and no compliance. Years ago, once the magistrate made his ruling, mm -hmm. there was no follow-up. So you go from 2005 in this case all the way up to 2000 and 
you know, whatever, 2000. Well, that's when he complied. Um, but there was no follow-up even after that. Right. We discovered it in 2015 or 16, whenever we started doing our personal audits internally mm -hmm. to get these things off the books and, and to, if they weren't in compliance, compel them to whatever way we could, uh, not forcefully, but voluntarily. So we have a lot more uh, communication with the public, which wasn't there years ago, because um, uh, our goal is voluntary compliance. We don't want to find people. We, we're not a revenue collecting. It's about complying with the codes and bettering the community. So we have changed the way that we, that we do business, and, and, and it's been working and proven positive results. So uh, other than that, you know, if, if if it wasn't working, I would say let's come up with another plan. But this is working. This case is one that we went out and r requested that he mitigate these fines so that we can get them off the books. Because mm -hmm. we have so many old ones that are just sitting there. Um, so we need to get these closed out. So. Great. I, I agree with that. And if there are any others, please bring them to mm -hmm. us and let's get them closed out, um, and I'm happy to hear the process has improved so much. Um, I'd also like to see, and I know that Betsy has brought this up several times, some sort of a process for reducing the fines. It should be a consistent and fair process applied to everyone in the same way. Because in this case, I mean, um, we're waiving, I don't know what the percentage is, but it is a large percentage of the fines, and in the past, we've uh, relied on 10% that we fine the person and waive 90. This is far more than 90%. So I just want us to be in a good position to always treat everyone the same way. Sure, sure. I, I understand that. And, and sometimes you have to look at the gravity of the violation. Right. Is it a, a property that's been a nuisance mm -hmm. to the adjacent properties for years, right. or is it just a car with no tag on it? Right. where the fines ran up to $350,000. So <clears throat> when, when this goes to the magistrate, which our process is a common practice or common process in, in other places too, where it goes to the magistrate, where he uh, looks at the, the, the factors involving the case and determines if, if what the request is is reasonable. So in this case, it was just a building permit that, mm -hmm. you know, he had one. It, uh, it expired, and he had to go get another one, which he did do. So the, you got to look at the extremities of each case and the circumstances surrounding them. So if it was just a car with no tag and there was no follow-up for 10 years, but, the, but the, you know, they could have taken care of it two years into it instead of us following up 10 years ago, and the fines ran up for eight years because nobody followed up. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of different scenarios that play into this. So coming up with a 10%, it, you know, I don't know, just my I, thoughts. I understand all that too. It's, it's never as simple <clears throat> as we'd like to think it is. I, I do understand that. Um, and then finally, I'll say I agree that our role is for compliance, mm -hmm. but our, our role is also to make sure that we're getting compliance as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I look back at the, and I've brought this up to you before, in my district I have a homeowner on Florida Boulevard just west of 26th Street West that will proudly tell the public that he's not doing anything to resolve his code enforcement matter. He doesn't want to. So I think we owe it to the public to, to act as quickly as we can. And I know that that's a lot of juggling, Jeff, and a lot of balancing, and you're doing a phenomenal job. Thank you, appreciate that. Thank you. Commissioner Whitmore. <clears throat> and um, first of all, maybe you could give us a list or give us, I'm sure you must have something, anything over five years old, or maybe, yeah, I would go start at five just so we get a, a, an idea what's gonna be coming before us in the future, but I, as you know, I do my questions, and I send it to Mickey and Sherry, usually on Sundays, of what I'm going to ask during the briefing. And on this one, for a change, I wrote, I'm not pulling it. But I, I, I just have to, so I, you got to look at the whole circumstance, which I know you did. And sometimes you can be too rigid in your decisions 
when you do fines. Uh, in 97 or 98, he called for an inspection. They told me it would be six to eight weeks, even then, to get it. So he just kept on building. This was his letter. He got a new wife, had added kids. He ended up having five kids. He never got the permit renewed. Him and his wife got into alcohol. It's a public record. <laughs> Him and his wife were drinking too much. He raised in his kids. In 2011, he finally came compliant. Then he closed his business. He's had uh, a heart attack and three heart surgeries. Now he's living on Social Security. So 10% of that would have been $30,000. That's probably, he doesn't even make that in Social Security. I'm sorry if some aren't interested in this, but I mean, I, I did read the whole backup, and I just feel that we have to look at each situation, and the whole role of code enforcement is to get people in compliance. So, but it would be interesting, Jeff, because when we get hit with these, you know, Glenn Gibellino sent us all this email. That's probably why we're even bringing it up. Why did we, why did we wait this long? How dare us? It would be nice to see how many outstanding we have coming before us. There is a process you have to follow, a legal process. You can't just go in and say, you know, there are, is a process, certified letters, all this stuff that has to go. So um, I'm okay because I'm finally glad we're getting it cleaned up, but it would be nice for us all to know what we have still outstanding that are really old, if you have it. I'm not going to have it right now. Okay. Well, it sounds like the good news is that um, we're clearing up a lot of cases that right. were not properly closed, is what you're telling us. And so we're going through, right, you're going through the, those and trying to clear them off of the books. So at some point, we're going to not have any more of those? Is that the objective? Well, I wouldn't say never. No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe on, not Jeff. 10 years old. <laughs> That's that. our goal. Okay. <laughs> but uh, we, what I'm saying is we have more tools now to work with, like the <coughs> system here, which we just got, what, two years ago. We passed okay. that into ordinance. Right. Uh, okay. So, which, you know, if they have to show up before they county judge all the time, they're going to come in in compliance. So we, we, these fines won't run like that. And we put a cap on them, too. So... And the injunctions are working as well, so okay. you, you won't see these 20-year-old cases. Okay. Good. Well, that, that sounds good. And uh, I agree that we need flexibility, but I don't like flexibility when it comes to government fines. I just don't. It doesn't, you know, arbitrary is not a good word when it comes to the government. So um, <laughs> that's why I don't like the, you know, a lot of flexibility. But I understand. I agree with you. Somebody like what Misty just said, who is clearly um, saying that, you know, they don't they're not going to comply and they don't care That's you know different. i'd like to get them fined early and often but yeah. uh, you, and that will take some subjectivity so i'll get with commissioner survey after this and find out who that individual is all right thank you <laughs> commissioner trace i move we accept the recommendation by the special magistrate second all right we have a motion and a second i'll open it up for public comment is there anyone that'd like to make a comment regarding the motion which is the recommended motion not seeing anyone come forward, I'll close public comment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh. I'll wait till last to do my comments, so I'll jump to Misty. Okay. Thank you. So just a couple of things. I have to start by congratulating Matt White, our latest circuit judge. I'm so proud of Matt. He's going to be an excellent judge, and the governor appointed him this week. Um, also, I want to say as a a reminder that this Friday, October 25th at 6 p.m. will be the first stormwater meeting and it will be in my district at the South County Library. Um, please come and learn about stormwater and how we can improve it and what it will cost if we impose a fee. Um, I really appreciate what uh, Commissioner Whitmore said about animal services. They don't get enough thanks and they do such an exceptional job. All of them in there do such a great job. Really grateful for them. And then regarding uh, Reggie, you brought up the homeless situation. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell you that I recently learned that the hot teams in Sarasota, the homeless outreach teams in Sarasota, mm -hmm. of those homeless members that they're working with, 40% of them are achieving stable housing. 40%. Right. It's a really big great. number. Oh, wow. So I think that's great success. Um, the meeting, uh, the trip to D.C. was was so wonderful. I'm so glad that uh, Commissioner Baugh kind of uh, 
you know, gave us a little foreshadowing of the great things that are coming ahead. Uh, Charlie set it up just perfectly. Thank you, Charlie, as always. And and our lobbyist could not be any better. And it, it was just such an important trip. So I'm really glad that I was there. And for those of you that weren't, if you want to come meet with us, we'll fill you in. But it's really time well spent. Can't. Can't. Sunshine. Sunshine. Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> you can only say it here. there is that. She even said it. She said it. Can't do that. <laughs> Well, so it was just so nice to be able to talk with the senior leadership in mm -hmm. D.C. and ask them questions. I mean, mm -hmm. Betsy DeVos was there, the Commissioner of, or Secretary of Education and Secretary of Agriculture yeah. and the drug czar. And there were just so many high-profile people that we were able to interact with, um, in addition to meeting with um, uh, Greg Stubbe, who represents us, and others. So great, great meeting. And that's it, and we're headed to Tallahassee as soon as we're done. <laughs> Mr. Bob? Yeah, I would just, uh, to, to keep uh, on with what Misty said, you know, uh, I'd also, we need to give a shout out um, to Congressman Buchanan. We had a fabulous dinner yes. with him um, at an event that he was at, and it was a great evening, had good conversation. Uh, Brian Mast, Congressman Mast, uh, was, as always, um, very, you know, helpful, and uh, he is moving forward on uh, water quality issues. Um, he, he's, he's really just a great guy. You know what? He says what needs to be said. He doesn't hold back. He says it. And I, for one, really appreciate that. Uh, instead of playing the political game, he, he's pretty blunt and to the point. Uh, Jocelyn was wonderful, her and her husband, her new partner uh, in her business. Uh, they were uh, wonderful as usual. We had great appointments that were scheduled uh, with her. So um, it was a great trip to D.C., and I look forward to the middle part of May where we get to talk even more thoroughly about Congresswoman uh, Napolitano, who I can tell you is – Wow, she's an older an older woman who is unbelievable. Uh, she doesn't mess around. She while we were in her office after we talked to her about why we were there, she literally got up from her desk or from her seat, walked over to her desk, got her cell phone, looked for um, the assistant secretary um, of the Army Corps, and and actually called him while we were there on the speakerphone and had a conversation, and um, I, I was blown away by that. I mean, this woman, she's got it going on. She's been a congresswoman for many, many years, and, and I have to tell you, politics uh, or party doesn't play a role in that because I got to tell you, she, she is a Democrat, and I walked out of there one of her biggest admirers. She is an awesome, awesome lady. So um, anyway, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. I got. I got a few things. Um, first of all, on the Washington trip, there were three things going on at once. Basically, <laughs> made it a little bit, um, a little bit tricky. We had the Florida Association of Counties, which organized the fly-in. Really great agendas that they brought forward. Um, opportunities to speak with leadership about different things. We heard a lot from FEMA. Um, when I was in with the Marco Rubio, we had presentations by FEMA really encouraging us to um, submit grants. We had one today, I saw a mitigation grant, mm -hmm. which I don't know how much, how often we take advantage of those, but repetitive loss grants, we need to make sure that we understand how those work and go after those more often. Something I heard, though, that I will tell you that does concern me a little bit, and I heard it directly from Marco Rubio, and then I heard it from the senior official from Army Corps that spoke at the White House later, was that there is this effort to try to push down more of the responsibility to local government from FEMA. Marco said it, you know, that they're supposed to be after the local government does this. That's never the way I've looked at FEMA and disaster mitigation. Mm -hmm. I've always thought, you know, we played their game, you know, right? We would try to comply with everything. But the intent sounded like they were trying to pass it more down to the local government that we would be doing the mitigation, even some of the costs, first. And that really concerned me, because that would be a, and I can understand why, given the number of disasters, but we need to be aware of that and make sure we follow that. Um, so that was something that I heard, but, um, and I'm kind of surprised Vanessa didn't say this, but I was really impressed with what the White House did for us. Mm -hmm. 
not the tour, but the afternoon session where they had people like Sonny Perdue taking questions from the audience. I mean, this is the Secretary of Agriculture willing to discuss with us our concerns. And people were not shy with asking questions. Um, the Homeland Security guy, yeah. I mean, just to see him, you know, it was really very fascinating to me because I've never had that opportunity to meet with people that are at that cabinet level position. Right. And so that was really a great opportunity. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I don't remember ever having that opportunity before now. Um, the, uh, again, the FEMA people, the panel on mitigation, they had a HUD person um, talking about housing mitigation. It was really a great opportunity. I will, one of the sheets that they gave us, so I will pass this information around, had everybody's numbers on the back so that you could contact them directly. I was going to talk to USDA about uh, uh, puppy mills, but I didn't, couldn't figure out how to ask the question in that crowd, so I'm going to call them directly and ask them the question. Good. So we have their numbers. I thought that was um, excellent. Uh, let's see. The other thing I want to just kind of switching gears, um, I do want to talk about because we are going to Tallahassee and I have been contacted by some folks that are very concerned about the idea of Longboat Key becoming entirely within Sarasota County. I've been told, and I think our, many of our members know this, I'm going to call you guys members because I think it sounds so cool, many of our commissioners, um, that's what they call you when you're in Congress, you're a member. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in Manatee County. I know. Many of our not commissioners DC. are aware of this, that there is very extreme lobbying mm -hmm. going on to mm -hmm. have um, Longboat Key go entirely within Sarasota County. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to Jack Gay about this. I said, when are you doing your um, poll? He said, well, it's not a poll. It's just an annual survey that we send out, and that question will be on there. play it. You know, I, I think we need very good information. I've talked to Sherry about this. Um, but first off, I want to say things like the Barrier Island study. I mean, that is a great example of us working together to solve problems. It's not easy. You know, Longboat Key in particular is stuck between two counties, right? Sarasota and Manatee. But you're not going to be able to cut off Manatee. We have two of the bridges, I said that earlier, that they use to exit from. It's going to be Water. extremely important. The other thing was the um, some of the coverage on the school costs that they pay. You know, what did I see? Twelve and a half million for thirty-five students. Well, Sarasota for thirty-eight students was significantly higher, but that wasn't Thought part of the that. discussion. You're right. That wasn't even part of the article. It just said twelve and a half million for thirty-five students. Well, they have thirty. Eight students coming in uh, out of Sarasota County, and I can't remember the number was. It was closer to twenty million. Whoa! I mean, it, you know, hey, God bless them in Sarasota County. They have a higher per student, um, mm -hmm. and you know I, that that needs to be fact checked. And Sherry's going to do that for me. I'll say that because I'm thank you. I'm never great like Carol is with numbers. I can't remember them other than the the number of students. I could remember that. Um, so I think that's extremely important. You know. It just occurs to me, where do people in Longboat Key go to go to the beach? I mean, yeah, the most of them, a lot of them have their own beaches, but a lot of them don't. Oh, yeah. So where do they go? Do they go to Lido Beach or do they come to Anna Maria Island? You know, and the loss of the tourist development taxes, where will those taxes go? What beach renourishment projects will be done? Well, we know Sarasota has big beach renourishment projects way south. Yes. We need to work with them better. I will say that right up front. We need, you know, the perception is the Longboat Key, you know, hey, they've got a very wealthy community. They have great leadership because they have a lot of retired executives. But they don't like to feel like they're not part of the county and not getting their fair share. And I know that there was a list given to Sherry. I hope she will share that with everyone when she's, when she's putting this information together. There's things that we can do to make sure that we're working well with them. But the biggest impact is to the school district. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Longboat Key has been incredible supporters of our schools. They really have. They're the ones that if you look at a lot of the tax referendums, they vote for it overwhelmingly, even though they don't have kids in school. But they do that because they value public education. They know how important education is. So we need to make sure that, that they're, yeah, it's easy to look at a shot in time, your tax bill. 
And I tried to explain to someone who called me about this saying, well, why is Manatee County's taxes so much higher than Sarasota's? Well, that's not the case. Yeah, it's because of the way our taxes are set up. Right. We have a higher ad valorem tax rate, but we don't have all these MSTUs, MSBUs that they build in. Right. But guess what? The city doesn't have to pay those. So that's why, yeah, it's just the way we're set up. So we've got a shot of, of what our taxes are right now. But that doesn't mean they can't change, doesn't mean we can't talk about things. So I hope this isn't, and I bring this up primarily because we need to talk with our state legislators about this. We're going to Tallahassee. It's not on our agenda now. So I would appreciate a motion from someone that we can talk about that. So moved. Second. Right. The motion would be that we were adding to our um, legislative, legislative agenda. agenda the issue of uh, Longboat Key and where it's located, whether it's 100% in Sarasota County, whether it stays split. Is that your motion? Yes, ma'am. That's my motion. That's my second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Commissioner Ball, you're actually on the board first. Yeah, I was, uh, actually I wanted to, I was gonna say something about the White House, but I'll come back to that. Um, with what you're talking about with Longboat Key, um, I did have a conversation with Charlie while we were in DC on this issue. Um, you know, when, when you look at, uh, and I, I did talk to Jack yesterday, as a matter of fact, at the MPO meeting. Um, you know, when you're talking about a petition where the residents in Longboat Key are, are able to voice their opinion on this, I think we need to, to realize and understand that this is moving forward. Um, it, they're very serious about it. I can tell you that their lobbyist, I ran into uh, their lobbyist last year when I was in Tallahassee, and he told me point blank that's why he was there, was working on this and talking to the legislators. I do feel that in the past, uh, sorry, I hope I don't offend anybody, but, um, you know, I'm on record as stating that, you know, I think we should have been working with Longboat Key um, in the past, and, and for some reason it never seemed to occur. Uh, they pay taxes, the, the, you know, the people on the Manatee side pay taxes just like everybody else in this county, and they really weren't seeing a lot for it. And I think that was wrong. I think that it's hurting us. I think that's why you're seeing so much happening right now. Um, and I can tell you that with what I've looked into when it comes to this, and I know Charlie, you know, I, I know there's some sand that we're giving over to LBK, but, do. you know, that being said, um, this is a serious issue. And our legislators are all aware of it. They've all heard about it. Uh, I know that um, when we were at the chamber retreat in Bonita Springs, I had dinner with Will Robinson, and he was telling me that he had a meeting coming up at LBK, and that was the topic to be discussed. Um, so, and he's told them, um, you know, that he wants to make sure that every avenue has been looked at with Manatee County. And Sherry and I have had numerous uh, conversations on this. I know that she's working very hard with Longboat Key. Um, you know, so I think at this point, it, and I'm hoping that LBK realizes this as well, and I'm going to stress it, uh, Jack and I are going to have another conversation, um, you know, our county administrator is working this issue very, very hard and taking it very, very seriously. Um, and so, you know, to change something as drastic as this, when there are alternatives that could be done. Uh, I think would be drastic for the for Manatee County and, and I think in some ways LBK. Um, so it, it is an important issue and I know Steve's not here and I think it in LBK his district. I think yes, and it's ours. Yes. Well his, obviously his and ours, ours yes. but I'm talking about the district Half of it, yeah. I think is is Steve. Um, but I know that, you know, I had a conversation with Sherry, I believe, while I was still in DC to let her know um, what I was hearing and um, you know she's working it very hard so uh, Sherry maybe you want to say something I mean we're all talking but you're the one that's actually in well, this fight working I can it. just confirm what's what we've done so far um, Tom Harmer the administrator reached out to me in the early part of the summer in June and um, 
we've communicated back and forth, and he, um, I got, I went out to a board meeting in July to introduce myself, and I stayed for the meeting because on their agenda they did have their legislative platform, and um, this item, the item for looking at a study for the the pros and cons of the two county, one county, was at the bottom of that list, and so I did stick around. And um, then later I uh, went back out and Tom took me on a tour, showed me a lot of things that they'd like us to look at and consider. And so those are the things that we're you know, trying to clarify before we put them in a report. Um, there was a number of them, and I think there were a few of them I've mentioned that uh, may be options that we could work with. Um, also, um, uh, since that time, I have met with Will Robinson and with Senator Galvano, both to follow up, you know, as you indicated, about the current information. And I'm working with the um, financial management director, Jan Brewer, to get you some recent comparison, as you were discussing about Manatee and Sarasota, not ad valorem, not ad valorem fees. So I think, you know, in just probably a couple weeks, we'll have something more concrete. And also, this is later. This is not something we would wait to do, but I just wanted to mention that we've confirmed the joint meeting with them for March 26th of 2020. So we have that meeting on the books. We'll obviously be talking about it much sooner between this board. Okay, uh, Commissioner Whitmore. On um, September 26, I uh, received information, and I guess it was in the East County Observer, and it, um, just I want to read it. it. It was in in the news, but I actually copied it and sent it to Galvano, and it said, um, "One county question: Which Lombok key has been turning over for some time, putting Lombok into one county instead of being split between Manatee and Sarasota?" Ramba thinks that's their lobbyist. He was talking to the East County Observer, I assume, um, what Galvano wants as his legacy. And I thought Galvano should see this. He even offered some solutions to assure Manatee's concerns. There's some land out in Lakewood Ranch you could trade to lessen the financial impact on Manatee County, he said. There's also a phase in on the tax impacts. So I sent that to Galvano, and he just he said this is absolutely not true. So I know he spoke to his the Lombok Key. See, Ramba is Lombok Key's lobbyist too. So he called Ramba immediately after that, and he was going to have this straightened out. He said this is not has not been on his plate, and um, so when we go up, it's good that we can talk to him about this because. And I immediately called Sherry right from where I was to let her know. No, actually, Sherry was with me. We were at a lunch. Um, but we passed this on immediately, and, I, and actually, that's right, and Galvano called me, and then I took it outside. But yeah, he, uh, he was surprised to read any of this, that, you know, Lombok Key's lobbyist is saying that maybe we'll trade land to, to decrease our tax issues um, with Lakewood Ranch. He, he knew nothing of this, and I think so. Ramba says this was incorrect, what was written, but they can deal with all that. But it, it is in writing, so I just wanted to pass it on, and I'll forward this to you. Okay, thank you. Because I know you're well, going to ask. I, I'll just say it's not unheard of to have mm -hmm. a community. If you look at Inglewood, Inglewood right. sits in two counties. Inglewood's not an incorporated town. Um, I only know that because I live there and my husband taught in, mm -hmm. at Lemon Bay. So um, I don't know that anyone has pushed for it. Clearly, it's... Um, you know, and I, one other thing I just wanted to say, because you, you do get a little competitive when you start hearing these, you know, Manatee County has done an incredible job with our utilities. We took advantage of the funding when it was available from the EPA to upgrade our utilities, and we even upgraded our utility system, our water treatment, when we didn't have the grant necessarily available. What, $20 million we just put into an upgrade. Right. Uh, uh, Charlie's <laughs> giving me... Out there. Number signs. I don't think it means steel, but um, <laughs> something like that. Um, I'm probably wrong with the number exactly what it was, but we invested quite a bit of money into yes. our Southwest treatment plant. Hope I got that one right. Um, to upgrade the treatment, and that's a water quality issue. We know Sarasota County is no secret. They're behind the eight ball when it comes to upgrading water quality. Um, but we need, you know, that affects our island communities, especially Longboat Key. Mm -hmm. This area in Florida in general is all about water quality. So be careful when you're looking at a snapshot is all I'm going to say. Once again, you're looking at a snapshot in time of a tax bill. 
And that does not mean everything. So, Commissioner Baugh? Yeah, I just want to add to what you said, Commissioner Benack. There are Sarasota commissioners that are working this hard I know. and course. using the snapshot uh, to do it. So, um, and I, I would hope um, that our county administrator will have the discussion uh, next time about um, our utilities uh, for Longboat Key. Um, and as far as the comments that I heard from Commissioner Whitmore about Lakewood Ranch, I can tell you that I've heard that. Um, I can tell you I haven't had a discussion with their lobbyist about it, but I did have a little bit of a discussion with uh, Rex Jensen in reference to it, and he'd be thrilled. Uh, so he said, but I'm sure that might have changed by now. Um, but, that, you know, so there has been uh, talk. Mm -hmm. Some talk of that. I don't. I'm not saying Bill Galvano is involved. I haven't didn't know about discussed it. this with Bill Galvano, <laughs> but um, I've not mentioned it to the other legislators that I have spoken to um, about it. So, but I, I know that that has that has been mentioned. All right. Um, we have a motion and a second on the floor. You got that? Yeah. Okay. All right, any uh, public comment on the motion? This is to add the Longboat Key issue to our um, state legislative agenda. Uh, I say no one come forward. I'll close public comment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those and opposed, nay. Commissioner Benack, may I finish on your, I had another comment to make <laughs> with what you were talking about the White House. Okay, chair uh, votes aye, motion passes. All right. Go Let ahead. me do it now. Okay. Um, just to add to the comments made about the White House, uh, I was blown away. I wasn't going to bring it up because I knew that either Misty or, or you would. Um, but it was an amazing um, afternoon, those meetings. And it started off that morning for most of us uh, with a tour of the White House. And, you know, anytime, I don't care how many times you've been in the White House, when you walk in there, you, you can't help but just be. Um, but it was cool you know, amazed with what you see. It was beautiful. And then um, I had uh, the pleasure, as well as Christian Ziegler from Sarasota and another commissioner from another county, uh, at being interviewed by um, the media on that. And, and I just, you know, I talked about the issues that we had actually covered, um, such as water quality, you know, the problems that we're seeing with red tide and blue-green algae and so forth. And I think it's, it needs to be stressed, uh, by this board that, you know, our president has truly put forth an effort to work with local governments, um, you know, by, by putting this event together at the White House. This wasn't a FAC. Uh, this wasn't a Florida Association of Counties event. This was strictly put together by the White House. So, um, you know, I, I think it says a lot. I don't ever remember that happening before. I've been a commissioner for almost eight years, but... Um, you know, for the, for the President of the United States with his schedule, I think he certainly deserves a little bit of respect on our end uh, for taking that, our issues very seriously and wanting to be helpful. So I just thought I would add that. Thank you. Okay, anything else? All right, Sherry. I did have one item. Sherry and then the county. Mr. Palmer, do you want to go first? Go, go ahead. Okay. Um, Commissioners, um, we've received some notice from the school board that normally you have the two, the annual assessment for interlocal agreement for your public school facility planning. You get that as a verbal report at a Council of Governments meeting. But since um, we don't have one of those in January, they're asking um, all of the different, not only ourselves, but all of the municipal, excuse me, municipalities, if they can do that in a written report instead of having it be verbal. It's not required to be verbal, but we just wanted to make sure you're comfortable with that. Yes. Any concerns? Okay. okay, thank you. I think you got the okay. For okay, that that's that's all. Better. All right, uh, Mr. Palmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioners, um, uh, there is, as I'm sure you're aware, there is a lot going on at the national level in, <clears throat> in the opioid litigation arena. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so uh, at one point I had planned on providing you with an update on the litigation today. But uh, but decided not to given the given the brief uh, uh, the brief meeting today and so my present plan is to come to you at your November meeting and give you a complete update uh, on where things stand with the opioid litigation both at the national level and in terms of our 
particular lawsuit. Um, and uh, uh, suffice it to say for the moment that the bellwether trial, uh, jury selection began yesterday, or was scheduled to begin yesterday, but apparently uh, there was a last minute settlement that was, uh, that was arrived at. The bellwether trial being two Ohio counties Cuyahoga, am I pronouncing that correctly, mm -hmm. and Summit County. Um, and there is a federal district judge in Ohio that is presiding over the entire uh, nationwide litigation pool. And so anyway, um, all of the remaining defendants settled at the last minute with those two Ohio counties with the exception of Walgreens, um, and uh, the, the overall settlement was $260 million for those two counties. Uh, I do not know the breakdown of those figures, um, you know, but, uh, but, but you know, that, that, that's a large number. Um, and so this would suggest that, uh, that there is good news uh, in the forecast uh, for uh, for the, the rest of the local governments that are that are part of this part of this uh, nationwide litigation. So um, so anyway, uh, I will give you a complete update and a complete report at your November meeting. And so stay tuned. Okay, sounds good. I heard the story on NPR. I heard a number of 48 billion being tossed around yeah. on NPR mm -hmm. yep. when it came to the national settlement. So that sounds like real money. Um, Use that in my district. Yeah, yeah. We could use that. Let us know. We'll be, we need to yeah. figure out how we're going to spend it. Now, the largest it. of the various defendants is in bankruptcy now, that being per Purdue right, right. Uh, Pharmaceuticals, right. Purdue Pharma. Right. But uh, in any event, um, I'll give you a complete update in November. Okay. Nothing else for the good of the order. We are adjourned. Thank you.